Monday, Central York. We'll go on the Wide but yes. Tonight we're just gonna share it, present it, share it, yep. Review it, yep. <coughs> By December 31st, we had to tell them if we were evacuating or leaving. And we said, no, we'll stay here. They're freezing the rain and everything. So, yeah, so it's all good. We're, we're going to update that as of February 26th. So, Carefully. Now, I thought that four years ago, so I know I'm I'm stretching it out as long as I can.
I'd like to call this planning meeting of the Central York Board of School Directors to order. Um, very quick reminder to the board members. Um, hi, Barb, I know you're on the phone. Hopefully you can hear me okay. I can hear you. We are recording. We're continuing to record. Um, and for uh, Barb's edification, uh, when you speak, if you could also please remember to turn your microphone on and, and get a little closer to your microphone. We've been looking at the, uh, the recordings and want to make sure Barb can hear and we get everybody recorded properly. So just a quick little reminder. Uh, we'll move right into the administrative reports. Here tonight from the high school is Mr. Kaufman. Welcome back. Thank you. We're both here. I didn't know who was going to give the report. He, w he wants me to get back in the swing of things. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, good evening. Um, I'd like to start um, by quickly saying a big thank you um, to the school board, Dr. Snell, Mr. Grove. Uh, really appreciate um, the support in my service, being gone for the last year. Um, I talked to many folks uh, in the past year, and I always say how great it is, uh, the employer that I have, and how um, they support what I do. So I really do appreciate that. And I'd also like to say a big thank you to Dave and the other uh, high school administrators, Katie Anderson, for helping out. Um, I know it's tough when I leave. Uh, they have to pick up different roles, do different things, do more. Um, but I really do appreciate it. So I just wanted to start by saying that. So thank you. Um, a couple of things going on at the high school. Um, the last semester, uh, three seniors, Mike Nelson, Josh Perkins, and Shakeb Tariq, um, completed a build-your-own course in the area of computer uh, programming. They created two projects, a fun project, and then they competed in a pr um, competition held by the Harrisburg University and the Hershey Company. The first project that they did, they actually... Um, designed a program that solves a Rubik's Cube, um, which is pretty cool. Um, but the next one that they submitted in the, um, in the project uh, with Harrisburg University um, was a project in the medical field um, that finds cancerous moles, uh, a cancerous mole finder. Uh, so what they did, I had, to, I had to ask that question, like, what exactly is that? So basically, you can like put a mole in front of your uh, camera on your screen and they wrote a program to look for certain things within uh, that mole and it can tell you whether it's a high probability of uh, being cancerous or not. So really kind of an interesting, um, s interesting stuff that our high schoolers are doing. And it also is a great example of the build your own course in a new, in that, in a different type of learning option where these learners were able to really expand what they wanted to do in the area of comp uh, computer programming, which they just wouldn't have been able to do in a traditional class. So um, I found that really interested and, and really proud of the kids. They won a big screen TV and some virtual uh, uh, headsets. Um, second semester seminars began this week. Uh, they will be running 17 seminars, uh, ranging from some AP prep courses to a canning making course. Uh, musical ensembles, and some physical fitness classes. Um, I'm really pleased to say that these unique uh, credit earning opportunities are still going strong, uh, and we still have good learner turnout for this. Uh, additionally, uh, the Central York Performing Arts Department will be presenting the musical Catch Me If You Can, uh, February 15th to the 17th, so mark your calendars if you're interested in coming. Our learners are hard at work um, trying to dodge the snow, early dismissals and delays and, and so forth in order to get in there and do their uh, work. Um, but they are working hard and we can't wait to see that, uh, that production. Uh, the high school administration continues to look closely and work with our at-risk and potentially at-risk learners uh, on a regular basis. Uh, last week we conducted our quarterly review um, and, we f that, and we really focus in on um, not only working with our seniors and making sure they make it to graduation, but working with all of our learners to make sure that they continue to continuously make that progression with their credits uh, towards graduation. Uh, this year, uh, we are uh, working with 11 seniors that are potentially at risk for not graduating out of 461. And I'm really pleased to say, uh, under uh, Dave's guidance and, and work, um, we have a plan for all 11. All 11, that plan is between their, uh, the student, the parents, the counselors, the administration, and the teachers all working together 
to hopefully make these uh, uh, 11 learners successful and have another year with all of our uh, seniors that started the year graduating. Uh, from the JROTC program, uh, they wanted to uh, mention that uh, their enrollment numbers are still going really well. Um, they gave me a three-year um, history of in 16, 17, they had 144, 17, 18, 149, and this year 145. Um, really great numbers. Um, the uh, headquarters is really looking for you to be at or around 100, and we continue to exceed that with lots of different programs and uh, our learners doing some great stuff there. Um, with that, uh, February 15th into the 17th, uh, the marksmanship team will be in um, Camp Perry, Ohio for nationals. Uh, our team, which was 33rd out of 90 teams in the nation, six out of our region qualified for the nationals, uh, so they will be going to Camp Perry, Ohio. Uh, the annual military ball, which is all student-led, uh, is on March 8th. Uh, the, Shippensburg, or the Raiders competition at Shippensburg is in April, and the, the Raiders are really looking forward to that. They, they love that competition. Uh, and then our cadets, along with um, Redding, Cedarcliff, and Chambersburg, um, are uh, going to um, Naval Station in Norfolk uh, for a um, fitness competition that is all designed and run through the JRTC programs. The kids are putting it on and competing. Um, and it's uh, pleased to say that through the donations uh, from the J uh, Air Force JRTC and uh, a few other areas like uh, the VFW, the children aren't paying for anything uh, except for their T-shirt. Um, so it's a great opportunity, and they are organizing it, running it, and participating. So it's a great opportunity. Uh, from the uh, Performing Arts Department, the uh, musical students uh, had... Uh, Central York High School musical students were selected for PMEA District 7 uh, Jazz Festival. So on the 18th, students from all around the area uh, participated. Uh, it's really a highly competitive competition. And this year, uh, several chorus, uh, choir and band students auditioned uh, for vocal jazz and jazz band ensembles. I'm pleased to say that An Lee, Allison Reeser, Alex Arrow, and Pierce Romy were all selected for the vocal jazz ensemble. Um, uh, really uh, uh, proud and excited for them. It's a 16 uh, voice choir uh, that they're participating in, uh, and that's great to have that many in that 16, uh, 16 voice <laughs> choir. Additionally, Michael Gilliland uh, was also selected on the vi selected on vibes to perform with one of the two jazz bands at the festival. So we're really proud of them, and that festival will be in March. Um, additionally, they had two students, Ryan Peterson uh, and Michael Gilliland, uh, attend the PMEA District 7 Orchestra Festival. Uh, Ryan Peterson was selected to advance to the PMEA Regional Orchestra. And finally, from uh, Mr. Trimmer, our girls and boys swim team uh, both won Division I championships this year. Uh, really pleased to say that. Uh, they're preparing for the league meet uh, this weekend, the 7th to the 9th and then hopefully to districts and to states. Boys basketball qualified for the league tournament, which will be the 8th through the 15th. Uh, currently one game out of first place with a few games remaining. Uh, girls basketball finished the season in fourth place in Division I, uh, and the girls are hoping to secure the last, uh, or to secure a, f a final District Three playoff berth. Uh, the wrestlers, uh, finished a successful season with quite a few wrestlers looking uh, to make some noise at districts and states. Um, the sectionals are February 15th, and Michael Wolfgram uh, really has his eyes set on a state title at 285, 285 pounds. Uh, competition cheerleading finished fifth in the district and qualified for the state tournament again this year. Um, and finally, I'd uh, like to congratulate our senior Cade, or Cade Prabula, who was selected for the Big 33 Football Classic. He's only the second uh, player in school history to be selected for this honor, so congratulations to him. Pending your questions, that completes my report for tonight. Thank you, Mr. Kaufman. Any questions or comments from the board members? Mr. Wagner. Yeah, Ryan, I'm not sure. And maybe you said it and I didn't hear it. Um, did we have students who qualified to graduate mid-year and took advantage of that? Yes, we did. Uh, as I recall, it was 11. 11? 11. 11. That's one of the questions I've asked 
you know, we've had this conversation. At what point do we have a mid-year graduation? Because <coughs> I think we're going to see more of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Blankenstein. I just wanted to quiz you. Do you know who the other student was who was in the Big 33, the other player? I do. It was Brad Seneff, yeah, 1975. 1975, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, try to have, I try to have my facts. I want to make sure I'm, I'm ready for anything. Mr. Lewis. You would have gone to high school with him, Ed, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what did you say um, the end result of the mole, cancerous mole finding app? Where did that go after he? Okay. Um, well, they, they won the competition that was being run by Harrisburg University and the Hershey Company. So it was just a, it was a competition put on by those groups. Uh, which they uh, they were selected as the winner for that that program. Well, fair-skinned me out of Scandinavian descent, I am a melanoma survivor. <laughs> and any time you go to the dermatologist and you come out with everything you had when you went in is more rare than it's not for me. <laughs> but, uh, so I, I, that is really cool. Uh, and, uh, you know, I see a guy regularly up in Hershey. I'm going to tell him about it, uh, <laughs> Dr. Adams. But that, that's that's incredible. But I would just point out, too, that a uh, different subject, but Ethan Olney from the yeah. ROTC unit just received his appointment to the Air Force Academy. Yeah. That's an early appointment, so that's two now going to service academy. So very proud of that. Yeah, that's excellent. And then we actually also have uh, Carson Salesgiver that got a uh, scholarship to Valley Forge. Um, it's an early commissioning program. So that's a two-year program, which is about worth about $100,000. So uh, it's great for him as well. Wonderful. Anybody else? Thank you, Mr. Kaufman. Thank you. Up next from the middle school is Dr. Harper. Good evening. In January, the middle school math counts teams competed in their first competition of the season at York College. Curtis Zhang placed first out of 156 students with his combined score from the sprint and target rounds. Um, he placed second overall after the countdown round competition. Four other students also from the middle school placed in the top 20. Mark Souders was third, James Liu was fifth, Josh Ilko placed seventh, and Austin Zhang placed 16th. The team of Curtis Zhang, Josh Ilko, Mark Souder, and Austin Zhang placed first out of 40 teams in the team round. The top 10 students from our middle school team will continue to the February 23rd competition at Millersville University. So we are definitely very proud of them and all of their hard work. Uh, last week during Fun Friday on January 25th, the middle school had a dodgeball tournament to raise funds for the American Heart Association. It used to be the Hoops for Hearts program, but now it's a dodgeball tournament. And the middle school raised about $2,000 this year. Um, the winning team was the Smiley Faces, Hunter King, Colin Dempsey, Will Shaver, Justin Maluzio, and Zach Osman. Congratulations also goes out to a team called the No Name names who were formed late in the game but were a fantastic underdog story. Um, our top fundraiser was Zach Osman. He raised $340 individually for the American Heart Association. And eighth graders from the middle school under the supervision of Mike Russell and Rob Decker are competing in the What's So Cool About Manufacturing video contest. They have toured, filmed, and interviewed at Penn Air here in York. Voting for this contest takes place from February 6th through February 8th. We will be sending out a link for everyone to vote. Um, you can go to the website whatsocool.org to vote, and we will be sending out that information later this week. Um, eighth graders um, participated on Friday in sessions led by school counselors from the high school to learn more about the various learning options that they have the opportunity to engage in next year at the high school. 
And this week at the middle school, we have various tables set up during lunchtime for our learners to learn more about the learning options as well as the multitude of electives that are offered at the high school. So Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of this week, we have various groups coming down from Apollo to Family and Consumer Science Department uh, coming to the middle school all for our eighth graders to learn about what they can take during ninth grade. So without any further questions, that concludes my report. Any questions or comments for Dr. Harper? Thank you very much. Thank you. I see all the middle schoolers here, or the elementary <coughs> schoolers here, so I'm not sure who's giving a report. Um, Mrs. Snare. Good evening. So there you see some Hayshare students. All of our elementary schools for January, we um, offered the family forum with Schoology and Mastery Learning. So here's some Hayshare learners that were taking questions and helping with the presentation. Um, they were sharing about their own learning and also uh, showing how they have made progress this year. Uh, next one is on technology, the end of February, February 25th, and that will be for all elementary. Sinking Springs. Learners on the vertical teams at Sinking Springs have been very busy with spreading kindness and encouragement to their peers. So here's an example of their work. They have a poster placed, and they have many posters placed around the school building. They are trying to inspire others and it spreads kindness through the building to help encourage a growth mindset toward learning as well as daily life. And Round Town celebrated community heroes and leaders through social studies. So Martin Luther King was highlighted and the learners shared the message through poetry and songs and parts of his speech. They also created their own dreams. There you see two of their posters. Um, one taking care of animals, and the other one getting rid of dangerous weapons. So the round town learners were able to think about Martin Luther King and his ideals and relate them to their own lives and talk about how they are caring sharing in our own buildings. At Stony Brook, um, on those uh, t-shirts, there are 100 items on each t-shirt. This is celebrating the 100 day of school. So they uh, decorated their shirts and displayed them proudly. They also, uh, in several of the classrooms, in Mrs. Ms. Klein and Ms. Thompson and Mrs. Martin, they had a task of creating with Legos something they thought could go 100 miles an hour. So they're proudly displaying those <coughs> objects there. And then a glimpse here of something very proud with North Hills. You can see there's a score there. On January 26th, or 26th two teams from North Hills competed in the state first Lego League robotics competition. So in the games, that black team, North Hills team, was 10th out of 52 teams, and it was the highest scoring of the nine York County teams. Great job. So that competition really focused also on the teamwork. Um, it was collaboration, critical thinking, problem solving, coding, and programming. A thank you goes out to Mrs. Wirtz, Mrs. Beckmeyer, the learners of the family, the families of the learners that help prepare them, as well as a thank you to the board and the district for supporting them in the competition. Awesome job. And then a little glimpse of some science pictures around the school district in elementary. So yes, we still have beans growing on windowsills <laughs> in our classrooms. This is one of those projects in kindergarten. And that is happening even though snow is falling outside. So experiments and hands-on learning, that's one of our greatest ways of science learning. 
Uh, here's another one of those experimentations. They love this. Um, this is weather and climate, uh, wind erosion and water erosion, and they get to show it through sand. Children learn from experts. So not just the teacher, but also from, here's a virtual visit. This is a fourth grade classroom. They're visiting with a geologist and learning about rocks and fossils through that visit. Children learn through problem solving. Well, in third grade, they had a mystery activity. Why are some places always hot? So the learners were in three different groups. They used a climate decoder, and they found out what the climate was for three different regions in the world, and then those findings created a climate map. And this is through any classroom you'll go into. Of course, we love our hard books, but also we love our books on the iPad. So there you see the QR codes. Um, learning through reading, reading about science, reading about social studies, reading about all areas. Uh, we're very fortunate in our libraries. We have wonderful hardback books. We also have the ability to look at things through our iPad with the codes there. You see the QR codes. <coughs> Just like you heard the winners of the North Hills team, children learn through teamwork and design thinking. Again, throughout all of our classrooms, these were just a couple of places throughout the elementary schools where they were involved in some activities, STEM, and one of them's creating a boat, and another one's building a bridge, and another one's creating some kind of a carton to protect an egg, but they work together in that teamwork, problem solving, critical thinking to create. And then just through that integrated approach to learning. So when the snowflakes were flying, that was a great time to connect weather and math because six sides on a snowflake and that connected with math. Social studies, maps, landforms, the connection is there. Writing prompts, you can connect that with any of our subjects. Kids love to write and they love to create. So through that integrated approach. So it just gives you a glimpse through the district and elementary classrooms. I'll be happy to take any questions. Any questions or comments for Mr. Snare? Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Grove? Good evening. Uh, I have three items to share with the board, the first being the Bullying Summit. Today, the Central York School District conducted the 2019 Bullying Summit. In attendance were learners, parents, teachers, support staff, board, community members. Meeting outcomes were hearing from a randomly selected K-12 learners and their parents, reviewing bullying data from the 2017 PAYS report as well as the 2018 Secondary Learner Survey, reviewing the bullying, cyber bullies, bullying policy number 249, learning about current district initiatives, identifying future district initiatives, such as uh, achieving the Anti-Defamation League No Place for Hate District designation, and the meeting agenda and accompanying attachments are provided at your desktop. So uh, if you want to take a look at the information that was shared today, uh, the data and uh, all the supporting information is uh, there for your review. The next document I'd ask you to look at would be the curriculum document that's in front of you, the five-year cycle. As we were prepared for the summer curriculum writing and the content areas of family consumer science, middle school and high school, as well as technology education, both middle school and high school, and finally business education high school, we've established a training date of February 19th, as well as actual writing dates of June 17th through the 20th at the middle school library learning hub. In addition, time has been provided for the two year, second year, uh, content areas of 712 Science, Art, Music, Health PE, Drivers Education, World Language to revisit and revise their unit maps in the areas of instructional strategies, skills, assessment, and resources. In August, the board will be provided the year three K-6 curriculum for review and sub subsequent approval. And finally, the five-year curriculum document is provided for your collective review. So again, in accordance with policy, 
we'll continue building the curriculum and bringing it forward for your review and uh, subsequent approval. And finally, educational focus for this month. The February educational focus is titled Preparing Learners with Physical and Intellectual Disabilities for Post-High School Life. Dr. Lees, Director of Special Education, Ms. Warfield, Transition Coordinator, will provide the community and board members with district offerings such as PenWorks to assist learners in receiving curriculum, internal external services, work-based exploratory experiences, internships, and if desired, portable certifications. So that concludes my report for this month. I'd be happy to respond to board questions. Uh, questions or comments for Mr. Grove? Mr. Lewis? <clears throat> I wasn't able to, but there was a very publicized meeting in West York about bullying. Did any of our people attend that? Do you know? Use your microphone, please. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, there was uh, quite a, a large turnout and a lot of parents very concerned. The biggest concern uh, appeared to be um, uh, school buses um, and, and bus drivers not being able to do what they need to do because there's a lot of disruption. And then in addition to that, their, probably their biggest complaint was a lack of response from administration, teachers, principals, not responding and following up on um, you know, threats to children or bullying. I mean, this one boy was basically roughhoused on the bus and you know, he's bleeding and he's being told to sit down mm -hmm. rather than being taken immediately to get some medical attention. And so, yeah, it was a little disturbing. It was disturbing. Um, the bus drivers, some bus drivers were there and shared stories on how they felt zero support from the district when they even reported the bullying problems when they're trying to handle on the bus. Um, one bus driver was there and actually got attacked by a parent, came on the bus and attacked her. So it was, it was really disturbing. A lot of parents were there with their children that were bullied. One teenager had to leave her high school and change high schools because the district just couldn't, couldn't uh, help the student. They couldn't stop the bullying. So in her junior year, she had to leave her high school and move over to Dover. I would like, you know, because I'm a big believer if somebody's doing something better than we are, then let's just steal it from them and we'll give them credit. But uh, maybe, if you wouldn't mind maybe that you could write like just a one page observations of what you had and sure, I'd be happy to. feed it to our folks to make sure that we're not missing something that they yep. I would have liked to have been there I'm sorry I was in Washington but yeah, I think uh, the feedback from the day uh, clearly uh, there were a lot of positive comments uh, from the learners uh, and their parents and there were some areas whether it's the bus transportation some concerns there uh, sometimes hallway transitions, there were some comments there, making sure that uh, we look at that. And the one thing that, at least in my mind, came out loud and clear was that we as a district are proactive. We have measures in place, responsive classroom, green circle, uh, rigor relevance relationship. We have some fundamental practices in place that really promote the human element, the relationship piece. <coughs> but I think we can always do better with that one-to-one, -one, and we call them touch points sometimes, just to make sure every child has resources that they know they can go to and seek that assistance. And to your point, uh, we have to keep reminding kids, if you aren't taken care of first, you need to keep advocating, and we need to keep advocating for you until we get it fixed. So um, today, I think uh, through the data from the PAYS, through the data of the recent survey, says that we're doing some good things, but there's also some areas and room for improvement. So uh, this was a great starting point, and uh, hopefully through that transparency, uh, we'll continue to take care of all of our kids because they deserve it. The one, the one thing that, one story that keeps coming back to me is when the parent came here and was talking about her son and how he was suspended for I think four days because he finally fought back because he wasn't getting the help he needed. He went to the teacher, he, he reported it repeatedly and it wasn't stopping. And that's kind of what happened with some students at West York. Go to, a, go to an adult, well they go to an adult, this one doesn't believe him, go to the next one, go to the next one, go to the next one and they're not getting the help and the support that they need. So how do we know that these students are reporting it 
when they're reporting it that they are getting the help that they need from the first person that they report it to. And when that student fights back, he's going to get punished for fighting back and defending himself. I have a problem with that. Mr. Goff? Just to sort of clarify, I guess, uh, <laughs> we're talking about two separate events. Um, the event that you, uh, Veronica, you and Jane went to, that was the one that West York, was related to West York School District, and they had that up at, I think, Leg Up Farm, right? And then uh, Mr. D uh, Grove is referencing the bullying summit that took place here uh, today from, from one to three. So there were two separate things, just so the audience is on the same page here. Okay. <coughs> Thanks. Anything else from Mr. Grove? Um, I, I have I a just, oh, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I have a question. Mrs. Um, Johnson. So when we're looking at this, sir, when was the survey that we were, this constant contact <coughs> survey that we were given, when was that taken? <coughs> Two weeks ago, I believe. Yeah. Okay, so I guess when I'm looking at some of these results, I'm seeing things that sort of do resonate a little bit um, with what we see in, w in West York, and I don't really want to compare us to them. It's just I'm looking here and some of the questions about do you feel safe reporting bullying? And there's a there's some kids that say yes, but then there's kids that have, have witnessed bullying and, and um, haven't reported. I guess it's just, <coughs> I guess the biggest concern I think is always that snitch, you know, or the retaliation. And I don't know, I mean, it's human nature. I think a lot of this is, is children being children. And I don't know how we make sure that these kids feel comfortable um, you know, it seems like being a snitch is like the worst thing in the entire world for a child. So I think I'd respond again, building the culture and climate that uh, <coughs> is extensive, that reaches not only all children, but to their parents and uh, that transparency piece, admitting when we could be better, but also complimenting the good things that we're doing. In addition, policy 249, the bullying and cyberbullying, that uh, requires us to post it, share it, communicate it, and that's been done K through 12. So uh, to your point, uh, there's always room for growth, and uh, we're taking it seriously, and uh, we'll continue to take it seriously. But uh, many favorable comments, but there's also uh, the never good enough for our, our mentality is, is there too, because if one is experiencing bully, and we heard that today, that's one too many. So we need to respond accordingly and build those relationships and uh, make sure that systemically uh, we're responding in a proactive way and a comprehensive way. So all learners can come and uh, experience the ideal learning experience, be cared for and loved. Mr. Lewis? I was just going to ask, does, uh, do we know what bus service West York uses? Anything else for Mr. Grove? I just have one more question. <coughs> um, so I know we talked about it in the policy meeting, and <coughs> I don't remember what the response was to the, the bullying um, and cyberbullying uh, policy. Have, we're still working on it, right? We're not making the change yet. Um, I think we <laughs> waited. Uh, I think we collectively agreed, Ms. Billman and Ms. Johnson, that we would wait uh, so that we could have today's meeting, gather additional input. So now there's two committees, the Mental Health Committee and the – a bullying summit committee that we're able to review the policy and give input and uh, whenever the next meeting is I don't know March we'd be able to come back Miss Johnson and then uh, make the changes to bring them to the school board for their review okay and you said that the, the policies are posted at one of the last meetings there was a multitude of uh, participants that are in different schools that said that the policy was not available in every district cl classroom and it was not posted in prominent location in each school and you said it, it, it is. So has that changed since our meeting? Absolutely. So we went back and made sure that uh, we okay. recommitted yep. to those uh, okay. those aspects Good. of I'd the like policy. I'd like to cross those off. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> That's it. Anything else for Mr. Grove? Um, first, I got to come back and revisit today's and make sure okay. we live up to our commitments there. Uh, the mental health committee is next, and that is March. That'll be the next time we revisit. We'll certainly share that. I don't have the date right in front of me. And then prior to the end of the school year, I'd really like to talk with Dr. Snell, but another opportunity to bring people back together to say this is where we are, this is where we're at now, and then project forward to next school year. Is there a way to bring in 
um, students that you know who have been bullied sure. to get their experience on their reporting experience. Yeah, absolutely. And we don't have to wait just for that in public. We could be meeting with them proactively to, to gain their feedback if as well. If they're comfortable enough to okay. come to a meeting like today. Sure. Yeah. Kids did today, and I would imagine they would feel comfortable too. We made sure it was a warm and inviting environment. Mm -hmm. So they added a nice, okay. nice uh, substance to the meeting. Okay, thank you. Uh, would like to <coughs> say thank you for this process moving forward. I don't know where it's going to go to, but I think it's timely. Uh, when the West York issue started to develop some media attention, I was aware of the efforts through the Mental Health Committee and then the bullying summit that Central had had was coming up. I think it's a chronic issue that we'll never solve 100%. There will never be a silver bullet. And I think, you know, just ha continuing to have to give it attention and grind on it is what we need to do with it. But I'm just glad that that's being done. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else from Mr. Grove? <coughs> Dr. Snell, I have three items. I'll ask Mr. Kessler to put up a quick spreadsheet as Ms. Billman comes forward. I'd like to uh, make sure that I announce the end of the school year as it stands right now with two closures in the school year. Um, what was May 31st, the last student day, 182 days, is June 4th. Last teacher day, as it stands right now, is June 5th. My two other items that I will refer to, Ms. Billman here, I'd like to get an update on our uh, substitute uh, support staff service and also an update on our health care transition. Ms. Sure. Billman. Very good. So starting with SOS, our substitute service that we're using for our support staff, specifically our cafeteria and our custodial workers. We've contracted with them about 10 months ago. Um, so at the end of last school year, we didn't have a lot to tell you because we were just getting underway with them, but now we've got about 10 months under our belts with them. And I'm very happy to report that we went from single-digit fill rates to now over 50%, which I know 50% still doesn't sound good, but where we were before, we're ecstatic with what we've got so far. And they're doing really good for us in terms of recruiting new folks. And we've actually been able to also hire on some of their folks as well. Um, they've brought such good quality folks into us. So we're really pleased with that. Um, so that's sort of just a quick synopsis of where we are with that. So. And I guess on uh, well, the teacher subs and then the, uh, the substitute <coughs> sub mm -hmm. staff sub, they're not actually then district employees. They Correct. meet all the district criteria for mm -hmm. employment, but are actually employments of the... Correct. Okay. Yep, we're contracting with them, with the agencies who then hire those folks. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Healthcare. So um, as you are well aware, um, as of January 1st, we went from the former PPO plan to a high deductible healthcare plan with an HSA. Um, we spent the bulk of December and the last part of November um, offering informational meetings and work sessions with folks. We did about 16 meetings total from uh, right before Thanksgiving through the Christmas break um, to try and inform folks of what it is um, this change meant for them and to help them figure out what um, how they wanted to sign up for those things. And then just recently, after we got through the start of the new year, once the change became real and everybody's got their cards in hand and starting to make use of them, we um, are in the process of finishing up 10 more meetings where we're just meeting with folks and letting them now ask some questions now that it's real and live and, and happening for them. Um, we would have been done those meetings last week, but Mother Nature interrupted, so we're going to be finishing those up this week. So, Questions, questions? on our health care transition? Ms. Billman deserves a great deal of credit for managing that well. In a Thank general you. sense, has it been well received? Um, I think uh, well received in the sense that they, they've been appreciative of the information. I think it's a lot for folks to take in. It's very different. Um, so I think the verdict is still out in that respect because I think people are still trying to wrap their heads around it in terms of what it means for their day-to-day -day practices because they're just starting to use it. Um, but I know um, one thing that I heard over and over again is people are very, very grateful um, to the district for the monies that they're supplying to the employees and through the HSA. That's been extremely helpful and well received. Thank you. Uh, it brings us to our first opportunity for citizens' comment. Uh, any citizen wishing to address the board, now would be your opportunity. Just please approach the microphone, state your name, uh, and affirm that you are a district resident, and you may speak to the board for a period of no longer than five minutes. There will be another opportunity for citizens' comment at the end of the meeting. Shava Aller, 636 Sinking Springs Lane. 
On the schedule tonight, you're going to be talking about comprehensive plan update. And I have been uh, doing some research for this. And there's a couple things I want to bring to your attention tonight. Also, the concern I had was what was in the paper on January the 20th uh, was the, the performance schools of the high school when Central was number 14 at 71%. Um, this was written by Shelley Riedel, who um, has a lot of experience with public schools. She was uh, in seven districts in four counties, and she was uh, previously a superintendent of, retired superintendent of Dallas Town. Um, so she has comments. I'm going to give this to Brent because I think he needs to make a copy for all of you to review. But also from her, um, she did an article in New York Sunday News on December 31st of 2017. And it was really interesting. I uh, got this out of my file because I think it's important to review. Because I think it, it all fits in as to something we need to look at as why the grades are in decline. And it is on the block periods. And she does a really good job explaining the change and how York Suburban, their grades are the top in the county, and they're still under the traditional format of the school day. So I think it's worth reviewing. And then I decided to pull a couple other articles out for comment. Uh, this one is uh, the middle schools in your county and statewide show steep drops in the PSSAs. The national report card shows flat results in reading and math. The results of the latest nation's report card are in and the news isn't, news isn't good. Fourth graders made no improvement in math or reading while eighth graders scores were flat in math, only slightly improved in reading. Uh, overall, only roughly a third of American eighth graders are proficient at reading and math, along with about 40% of fourth graders. The figures are in line with recent trends. Students made big gains in the 1990s and early 2000s, but there have been no major improvements since then. If you remember what happened in the 2000s was No Child Left Behind. The federal government got involved. Here's a report card. The gap is widening. 12th graders' test scores indicate just a third are ready for college academics. The report estimates about 37% of students for both reading and math scored well enough to be considered likely to possess the knowledge and skills to be academically prepared for college level work. A's are on the rise in report cards, but the S SAT scores decline. Researchers warn of possible grade inflation. The good news on America's report cards, more high school teachers are handling, handing out A's, but the bad news is the students aren't necessarily learning more. Recent findings show that the proportion of high school seniors graduating with an A average, that includes an A minus and A plus, has grown sharply over the past generation, even as average SAT scores have fallen, suggesting that those A's on report cards might be fool's gold. Foreign exchange students say U.S. high schools are easier for them. A new survey of foreign exchange students who spent time in U.S. high schools find 9 out of 10 of them think school back home is more challenging and the percentage who thinks so has grown. He found that the new crop of students believe more strongly that school here is easier than in their native country and that students here don't work as hard. Here's a, a German uh, exchange student. He describes uh, German school as being more challenging comparing to, he was at Dover, block scheduling, meaning four classes in one day. German schools focus on more. We have, for example, every subject the whole year over, we have more subjects to concentrate on. And he noticed that the extracurricular activities are um, a big part of the, the school with it is, isn't like that in other countries. School ditches online learning after parents revolt. 
So the fast-growing online platform was built uh, with help from Facebook engineers designed to help students learn at their own pace. But it's been dropped because parents in this Connecticut suburb revolted, saying there was no need to change what's worked in a, a town with a prized reputation for good schools. And screen time, bad for students. A recent New York Times article issued troubling warning. It could happen that the children of poor and middle class parents will be raised by screens while children of Silicon Valley's elite will be <coughs> going back to wooden toys and the luxury of human interaction. The digital divide it claims is operating in reverse. They saw how it was harming their kids. Shelva, do you have much more? You've sort of reached your time limit this opportunity for comments. No. Um, the, other, the other information I'm going to give you, I researched uh, in, in your report what you're going to talk about, and I looked up, I researched ISTE, ISTA, and um, you don't believe that it is uh, connected with the United Nations. It is. Educators eager to implement project-based learning in their classrooms can get started by presenting students with United Nations list of 17 global goals, which are part of the UN General Assembly 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The global goals represent problems of, uh, of it's global, it's all global, the 17, they're all here. So um, I'll let Brent give you copies of that. Thank it, you. Some, to review, I think we need to look at why our grades are in decline. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else at this time? Okay, Dr. Snell, discussion items? Thank you, sir. The uh, first item is the uh, graduation date uh, for the graduating class of 2019. Uh, what you have here before is our recommendation of May 24th. Uh, again, uh, showing the end of the school year is June uh, 4 and 5. And so by school code, we have to have 180 days for our seniors. And so 180 days uh, would get us to May 31st. Uh, as you know, year after year, we have uh, made recommendations that have relied on using Act 80 days. We have five Act 80 days that we can use, technically six if we really needed, five that we, we talk about as, as viable. Um, what we would need to maintain graduation on May 24th would be four out of five. That would be using four dates on the May 28th. 29th, 30, and 31st. And so it is our recommendation that we hold graduation on May 24th. Input, comments? Here, just a comment. <coughs> Mr. I'm Wagner, not sure. questioning the date. Yep. If we really ran into a pickle with other snow, other type of activities, are those using Act 80 days in place of instructional days? That's K through 12. We can do that if we needed to. Yes, sir. Okay, thank yes, you. Yes, sir. K through 12. Mr. Peckman. Um, I disagree with the recommendation. I believe we should graduate our students on May 31st. Thank you. I'm, I'm in agreement with Mr. Peckman. I'm not sure why we, I know everyone's done, they're graduating, but I just feel that I don't know what the rush is, and normally we're around Feb we're around June 1st, so the 31st puts us there, and the 24th is also a holiday weekend, and I know it's great for some people graduating, but every everybody's not graduating out of our 6,000 students. I Mr. Blankenstein. Yeah, I would ask Mr. Peckman uh, what would the criteria, why are you, why are you asking or why are you uh, do determining that we should change to 31st, if, you, if, if I may. Well, I've come from an area where they graduate on the last day of school, so that would have been June 4th. I think because of the snow days, it actually works out ideally where you can have the seniors graduate a day or two early on the 31st. Um, I'm looking at past graduation dates. It's always been around the first weekend in June. Now we're the getting to the last weekend in May. I mean, we just keep moving the calendar back and back and back, and I think we need to stop at some point. And if we have to go to school 180 days, we should go to school 180 days. Other input, it's not a decision we have to make next week. Um, obviously, there can be some 
weather considerations, and we can come back and, and firm this up at our March meeting if necessary. But um, the administration wanted to bring it forward. They usually bring it forward around this time every year, at least for the discussion's sake. Mr. Lewis? I, I would just like uh, Dr. Snell maybe to explain a little bit why I think I think I would go kind of lean towards the 31st, too, just knowing that from what I remember the last couple of years, March has been a pretty snowy month, surprisingly enough. <clears throat> I'm not uh, going to predict the weather. <laughs> I can tell you that. Um, just <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm just not going to do that. Um, here's what I would say for some context. Um, normally we finish, you're absolutely correct, June 4, 5, or 6. And so when you wrap up graduation a week early, that would be in the May 31st time frame. Original calendar, we were to be done on, on May 31st. And so again, we still have the number of days we've lost to. Um, so while the 24th strikes you as early, it's because we were supposed to be done on May 31st, which I think in 10 years, we've never been finished in May, whether the weather doesn't help or not. But I don't believe any calendar I can recall had the last student day on May 31st. So it's still a week short of everybody else. It's somewhat, you know, again, what we've done. And, and granted, this ultimately your decision, and I respect that. Um, but that's the, the May 24th sticker shock, if you will, as opposed to if the calendar was built to be done five or six, we would then probably come back at May 31st, which I think is some of your recommendations. So that gives hopefully a little bit of a context. And the weather is the weather. I, we'll see how that plays out. Um, more of a question, I guess, for Mr. Kaufman. Uh, finals are going to be held 21, 22, 23 if graduation would be the 31st because most of the following week then is wrap up and practice and things like that. If it, if it would move to the 31st. Right. If it would move to the 31st, um, then the 30th and the 31st would be the last graduation day for Okay. And if we did make it the 31st, you, that does not impact your ability to do move the pride and all that kind of good stuff, right? We would, uh, we would be flexible with the date that you would set. Other input? Comments? I heard at least I, I, I Mr. Think, Lewis. I think, I think we should sort of poll and figure out where we stand on this, but just give some guidance. And, and I, I took what Mr. Lewis said. I, although we don't have to make a decision, I think we should next week. Um, and I, I would tend to go with the 31st. That gives us a little flexibility if uh, the groundhog was wrong. Um, so I was in Punxsutawney. I know that would give us the most flexibility, that's for certain, with an, uh, with an unknown future of the next six, and eight weeks. And so people weeks. can plan. I think it, the sooner we do it, the better. I agree with that, and I was, I'm going to lean towards the 31st as well. That, that's enough of a people for me to, to say the 31st, and Joe, we'll put that on for next week then uh, to set that at the 31st. And so that way everybody can plan accordingly going forward. Next uh, discussion item is the school district draft calendar for the 1920 school year. Um, our recommendation is there for you. Um, I think, uh, again, similar to this year, the last school day is as of now, May 29th. Um, there was a piece there in December that we made December 23rd a um, vacation day, um, and so it is there. The last year when I looked over our notes <clears throat> with the start of uh, school in the third week of August, um, the heat uh, acclimatization, acclimate, how do you pronounce that, acclimatization? You get used to the heat. Starts August 5th. For football. For yep, for football. Fall and fall sports start on the 12th. That was a question that we asked last year. 
Um, and uh, there was a question around Thanksgiving Monday being a contractual day or not. It is not a contractual day. Uh, or there are any implications. So that is our recommendation. We'd be happy to answer any questions. Thoughts or input? <laughs> pretty, currently, it pretty much mirrors this year's calendar by a one day different. One, Correct. Everything would yeah. finish up. Um, I know that there was some discussion about, did anyone get any word from the um, Game Commission about hunting season? It hasn't been approved. Yeah. I think they've talked about it. Yeah. I just, do we ever have any studies that talk about the impact of not having that day off? I mean, I, as a parent, I just think it would be nice when you have, and especially since we've got the 23rd in December, we have a week and we got a big break there. And it just, look at March. I don't know about everybody in the classrooms, but I think everyone's starting to lose their noodles a little bit. But, you know, it might be nice to have, you know, move that day. I, I, I don't know what the impact is. I mean, students would probably just not come to school, but it's not a law, right? No. Pennsylvania, it's it's kind. I know. I know what it is. I'm just <laughs> saying, but academics, I mean, so several years ago, eight, ten years ago, we that was not a day off. And there was a lot of pushback staff-wise, as I remember, and it was added back in as a day off the following year. I think you're correct. It's not so much not so much for the students, but for the staff that are, are availing themselves of the Pennsylvania right of hunting on that day. Well, the male staff. I, I think what no, I read in the paper, Jane, <coughs> a couple of days ago was that, I don't know why it's so darn complicated, but the Game Commission <laughs> wants to move it, but the governor's got to sign it, and it's still months away, you know, so. It's not about the first day of hunting any longer. It's about the day off that's always been the day off, the Monday after Thanksgiving. And that's right. what the pushback was eight, ten years ago. There's people who still hunt. I used to hunt. But that's really not what the issue is. I, I mean, I would tend to agree with you, Mrs. Johnson, that um, a, a day off in March, March 16th after the 13th would be, I think, much better than Thanksgiving Monday, but uh, from a staff perspective. But again, I'm not in the classroom, so that's a, you know, that's a long stretch there for them. Just out of curiosity, then, if it's a staff thing, do they take a personal day? Well, I think they take personal days when they feel they need them. <laughs> or sick day, whatever. Sick day. But they better have any deer hanging in their garage. They could. I mean, <coughs> you know, they can. That's their, that's their choice. <coughs> if they'd still, I mean, from the standpoint of a hunter, if the day wasn't off in the counter and they wanted to hunt, they'd probably put it a personal day. Right, and I'm fine, with, I'm fine with the personal day to do that. I don't see a problem. I just, like I said, having two weeks off, December, January, right on top of a five or six day weekend and leaving March, we're talking about the mental health of our kids and our staff. I think it would be nice to have a little bit of a long break somewhere else. Welcome to real world for the work. <laughs> okay. What does anybody else think? I Mr. Tried. Lewis. Well, I just want to ask in a general sense, I mean, there's nothing that, this is a no win thing. You can't make everybody happy all the time. But, um, <coughs> Are, are we sticking with the philosophy that we're not going to build in snow days? Uh, the, the administration has right now for this recommendation. And I guess based on this year's experience and past experience, is that what we want to do? I'm just asking the question. Craig, I think with uh, unless there's any reason to think that the state won't continue with the flexible instruction concept, this really puts build-in days at the end for extreme circumstances. So I think that's where we are this year. Not that I necessarily support that concept, but that's where it is, I think. Yeah. Gives us the most flexibility. But again, the, the days off are the days off then, and people can plan for them as such. We've, we've gotten that feedback enough times that, well, it was a snow day, and now we're using it as a vacation day, and so what? We're still not going to come because yeah, we've, we, we made our plans, you know, so. I can see it both ways. But. Well, and we've had quite the discussion a week or two ago about whether we use our flexible instruction days versus 
built in snow days and I'm okay either way, but I'm just wondering if we ought to pad this here or there a day or two. Did the uh, <coughs> was the state's approval for two years? Do you know? It was it was for one year. Just for one year. We went back and looked. We averaged between I think three and five, on average, snow days. There was a uh, one year we had I don't know it was ten or something. It was it was an outlier, and then there was one year where we had one or half. You know, I mean, if that. So you can build in the days again, it would get you to June 4 or 5, if, if that, you know, would be your preference. And, and there was the sense of we haven't finished this year without any. Um, and and I think to, to President Wolfgang's comment, there are some folks that want a guaranteed day off so they can make travel arrangements that, again, hasn't played out yet this year. But we average about three to five days. Mr. Peckman, is, is the uh, last day of school a half day? Um, it is. If you will look on the 29th, it's got that shade of bluish um, that you can't see very well there, but it is. Yes, sir. The only, my only comments, and I know I'm in the minority, would be to start later. And uh, also, uh, I would get rid of half days. It's just that my thought that if you're going to bust the students in, why not keep them there for the full day and maybe have more full day and service days as opposed to half days. And it also eliminates the difficulty of a half day when it's snowing and how to get the kids in and out and what to do with them. Other comments? Mr. Yeah, Wagner. I, well, I, several years ago, we talked about more of the concept of the full day and service type of things rather than half, if I remember that, Carl. It never went far, but I remember having that conversation. Mr. Gothy? Um, go back to October. There is currently a half-day in-service day scheduled for the 11th of October. Would there be any harm in moving that to the 25th of October? 24th and 25th, I believe, are junior rifle uh, days uh, in Pennsylvania for deer hunting. And if the students are not going to be there, it's not going to be out on the 11th, it would be beneficial for the kids that do hunt to have that on the 25th as opposed to the 11th. And if there's really no friction anyway either on either direction and why not do it on the 25th and, and facilitate that for the kids that do want to go out and get a day in the woods without adult hunters around are you suggesting uh moving both those days oh just the in, the in-service day yeah. oh. <coughs> it's a half day it's a half day on the 11th is a half day You could look at that. I mean, it mm -hmm. certainly could be looked at. It's just tagged on because yeah. it's Columbus Day. Right. But so. Nothing says they can't yeah, be moved. If, if you look at Columbus Day as a half day, you know, if you were to have a student that had a kid that had more than one child, you know, that's one thing. I, Columbus Day is not a very good day to be hunting for deer in the fall. Any other comments? <coughs> I, I don't think we've heard enough to make any built-in snow day fixes, so I think this is going to stick as the way it is with the days they are right now. 10, um, 11 to 10, 25. What's that? You want to go the 11th to the 25th? I can bring that back. No. Yeah. Uh, Sorry. Columbus Day. Okay. What about any, any other input about the, the uh, Thanksgiving Monday from anybody? Not I, I, I think by the time this is published, the, they will have moved. It seems to be a consensus. To, yeah, but who knows? Well, we still have the opportunity. I mean, this doesn't get <laughs> get published for a little while yet. We we can always amend it if something changes. We could. It would be easy to move that day mm -hmm. uh, later on. Um, throughout any any time, really, between now and the end of the school year, if the state actually pushes that through. Mm -hmm. I sure. think it's got a good chance actually happening now, but um, leave okay. it the way it is and bring it back. Bring it back next week. Yes, sir. <laughs> next item on the agenda is the comprehensive plan. I will uh, turn it over to Mr. Grove here, um, but I will just simply say that uh, 
If you recall, uh, you all approved a comprehensive plan. Um, we are in year one of three, and uh, we would like to give you a brief update. Uh, again, we have some principles here that will help. We'll go through this at a quick clip, and then certainly be happy to answer any questions that you have. Mr. Grove? Thank you. As we think about uh, collaboration and making sure that we have input from all stakeholders in the school district, this board's continued to provide us that opportunity through the MCL district committees. They are chaired by our principals. Many are here this evening, and we have human element followed by learner work. Ms. Dick's not able to join us tonight. I'll step in for Ms. Dick and do my best. And then we have CIA, technology, and structure. So, Dr. Miller, would you come up and enlighten us with the human element? Thank you, Mr. Grove. Good evening, everyone. Uh, pleased and proud to provide you with an update on the good work that the uh, Human Element Committee has been doing over these past several months. Um, and I'm just really proud to be a part of this team. And those of you that have joined us for meetings, you know that this is uh, a wonderful, eclectic group of folks from the community, parents, learners, teachers, support staff that all come together in the name of uh, doing right by our kids. Um, so we're working currently on three very specific targeted goals as part of the comprehensive plan. And uh, those three broad topics, and then I'll share a little bit with where we are, uh, includes a mentoring program, um, increasing our support programs for learners, and also something called a personal learning network. So I'll go into a little bit more detail with those. Um, each of those very specific goals are predicated upon the idea of increasing, improving, and building relationships, uh, which I know is something we've talked a lot about. Um, and at times like today, I thank Mr. Grove also. I echo what Mr. Gothy said in terms of today's bullying summit was a wonderful representation of a piece of the human element. Um, anytime the big people can get <coughs> together and talk about what we're doing and doing right by the, the little people is a, is a good day. Um, so more specifically with our three goals that we have, uh, in terms of the mentoring program, um, there was a lot of research that was done early on in the school year in terms of what are some other school districts doing, and uh, Mr. Livingston and uh, Mr. Hom lead up those pieces. Um, currently, the team uh, uh, is, is looking at specific frameworks for each of our schools and what would be appropriate to provide mentoring programs uh, in all of our seven schools, um, whether that be peer-to-peer -peer or obviously employees that are helping to mentor some of our uh, youngsters. Um, that would most be most appropriate at the primary level. Um, so those are pieces that we're talking about. What could it look like and sound like? Again, to increase those relationships and uh, mitigate some of those barriers that we know exist. Um, in terms of the support programs, um, there's a lot of good work that's being done in that area, too, and we know that we now have a mental health uh, safety committee that's also going to be partnering a little bit with the Human Element Committee in the name of what are those outside agencies and services that we can count on and rely on uh, to help and assist our learners. And currently, that particular uh, subcommittee is, as I said, working with the Mental Health Safety Committee uh, contacting social workers to discuss uh, different partnerings and opportunities that we have through our community. Um, and then finally, that will culminate in a survey to the staff, asking them specifically about some professional development opportunities um, that they see a need in in this particular area. Um, and then finally, the personal learning network uh, is near and dear to my heart. And um, we heard just this afternoon, as I'm sure you've all heard, that each time our learners jump from one level to the next, there is a little bit of a hiccup for them. Um, they feel a, a slight pang of isolationism as they move forward. And this particular sub-goal is really working on keeping those connections and bridging those connections as learners move from one level to the next. Um, so we're not sure if it's going to be an app or some type of a web-based system, um, but where learners can kind of keep, keep on keeping on with those folks that they felt those connections with. So uh, just uh, in a very simplistic manner, kindergarten, your personal learning network is probably mom, dad, and your teacher. First grade, it might include the principal, your next teacher, and so on and so forth as it builds and grows. Um, we know that there's a lot of good work done at each level to forge and build relationships. We don't want the learners to move forward 
feeling like they have to start all over again. Um, so that just brings you up to date on the goals that we've been working on. And uh, I'd just like to close uh, by making a, a just a quick statement in regards. I really appreciated the uh, citizen comment that we heard earlier. And uh, I also uh, read that in the newspaper. And being here for 21 years, you feel a, a slight pang of, hey, that, that hurts to see that, um, what happened to Central, those kinds of pieces. But there's always two sides to every article in the newspaper. And one of the things that I feel really proud about is some of those same school districts that you see at the top of that list in that particular article. Um, many of those principals, Dallas Town, Suburban, um, have reached out to me and I know other members of our team to say, hey, how do you guys do this, uh, bringing in T.W. Panessa for services? How do you provide diversity education training for all of your staff? How do you put together a mentoring program? So I just think it's interesting that, um, you know, you take the scores aside, we're viewed as a leader in terms of many other areas um, in York County. And I greatly appreciate um, the time and commitment and the energy that you put in as a school board um, to allow us to have these opportunities to talk about what is best for our learners. Um, because we know that if we don't mitigate some of these barriers, we're never going to get to uh, any of the real learning that needs to occur. So again, you can feel really good about the efforts and hard work that our teachers put in to teach reading, writing, math, social studies, science, all the core areas. But I think you can really feel proud of the conversations that we're having on a routine basis about how to take care of the whole child, the social, emotional, and mental health pieces. Um, so I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have regarding the work we're doing in the human element. Anybody right now? Thanks. Thank you. Okay, the next committee is that, Dr. Miller, thank you. The next committee is that of the Learner Work Committee. And again, uh, Mrs. Dick is with her family tonight due to a situation, so uh, I'll do my best to stand in. So to echo uh, Dr. Miller's comments, human element was purposely put in that uh, sequence first because everything revolves around the whole child. As we go to the Learner Work Committee, we are building agency with the learners. And what that simply means for our community members is that our children are part of the process. It's not done to them, it's done with them. They are active members of the learning process. It's not sit and get, it's be part of the process. So the first aspect of developing learner agency is providing learners with review documents will be placed in their grade level showcase e-portfolios. The learners will review documents to reflect on academic progress, identify their best learning styles, and set goals for future learning. So that doesn't mean a teacher is void of that conversation. The learner is taking the lead in the conversation, and the teacher is facilitating the conversation, and when necessary, leading the conversation. So we are atypical than any other school district I know as we try to make sure that learners are learning with the kids. <coughs> and the teachers aren't the sole deliverers of instruction in the classroom. The second is, in addition, uh, our efforts to develop a K-12 design thinking process, which encapsulates things that we've heard before, STEM, the science, technology, engineering, math, 21st century skills, project-based learning, making sure that kids are engaged over a period of time with uh, inquiry and uh, coming up with uh, new ways of solving problems, developing that grit that our community members, uh, our business leaders ask us to have in our uh, learners as they graduate. Our collective goal is to create a learning environment which promotes the development of knowledge creators, computational thinkers, creative commu communicators, and innovative designers. And to Dr. Miller's point, in nowhere in there did I say test takers. So again, computational thinkers, knowledge creators, creative communicators, and innovative designers. Those are the young men and young ladies that will make tomorrow better for the rest of the world. And then finally, developing K-12 cross-curricular writing exemplars. We firmly believe that one of the best ways to get kids to become better readers is to make sure they're writing often whether it's in math, whether it's in science, social, uh, science or social studies. So we're developing exemplars for our teachers to have access to so they can compare and help the kids compare where they are in the continuum of learning. I would be happy to answer any questions for the Learner Work Committee.
Okay, next I would invite uh, Ms. Grondin, if you would, curriculum instruction and assessment. Good evening. One of the um, parts of the CIA committee, as we call ourselves, I think one of the, uh, the best part of this committee is just the conversations that happen between K through 12 teachers um, who come from all different departments, who come from all different um, experiences. And so, again, when we get together um, and the conversations that we have about the three areas, um, very rich in conversation and just what we can take from high school, what they can take from us as the elementary. Um, and that doesn't happen um, as much um, as we'd like it to, but again, it's a really good way to have some conversations. Conversation. So the main focus of our CIA committee has been the showcase portfolio, and Mr. Grove already alluded to it. Um, the showcase portfolio um, is using the platform of Schoology. Um, it's a K through 12 initiative, and really focusing on the learner, um, choosing um, artifacts that they can place in Schoology. Um, some may be academic. Um, some may be very arts, um, visual, um, performing arts, um, as well as outside activities that they enjoy. And so we're really trying to think about the learner, um, how they can choose items and artifacts, and then also the reflection piece, because that's really important too, why did you choose this? And so our youngest learners um, may do that reflection as um, a video, uh, and then our older um, students also could do video or the written part of it. So this year, our CIA committee, as well as other members of our staff, are piloting the Schoology um, e-portfolio, um, beginning to look at it, um, and uh, also beginning to look at the focus. For right now, the focus is really looking at parents and um, our staff members. But as this um, e-portfolio progresses and as it grows, um, looking at for post-secondary options as well and how they could share it um, with future employers, future colleges. So again, that is our first step of our CA committee and uh, we're really proud of, of the products that our kids are producing and how our um, staff members are working with them to create the best showcase portfolio. We've talked a little bit about mastery. Um, you heard from Mrs. Um, Snare share that at the K-6 level, we um, concluded our parent forums last month to talk about mastery, really helping our parents understand the grade book, um, the language, the common language, which we always talk about. And uh, so at our K-6 level, this is really the beginning stages of making sure our, our learners are aware of the mastery competency in developing, as well as our parents, and for our parents to understand um, the grade book. The other part that our secondary level is working um, on is how do they show mastery of standards and how do they tag those standards to assessments. And so these are very much ongoing parts, um, a little bit different at the elementary than the secondary, but again, um, ongoing. And the last part is just common assessments. Uh, we continually look to see what assessments that we have through the K through 12 level in all areas and uh, where is the needs there still. Um, we're identifying some of those still in language arts. Um, again, that is a process of looking K through 12, common assessments, uh, what are we still missing and what do we need to grow and how do we create better assessments um, for those standards. Any questions? Mr. Peckman. Does this deal with, this topic deals with grading and report cards? Yes. Have you ever thought of going back to something that's easy to understand for the K to six? Level. That's why we're working on the mastery competency in developing and we, we gave our parents in that parent form some very easy words um, to make that correlation to what mastery competency in developing met. So we're working very hard on that. Um, again, away from the letters, um, but again, the mastery competency. Like mastery, you got it. Um, developing, you know, we're still working on it and competency, you know, it's there. So again, trying to give some really simple words that our parents can understand as well as our learners can understand. I'm just wondering what was wrong with the U, S, and O? Um, because we're looking at standards, um, trying to say, okay, mastery is this of a standard where the U kind of, again, um, doesn't quite equate as much to that mastery of saying 80% or more is mastery. So, and Mr. Peckman, at the end of the day, we're hoping that the Schoology, under the um, umbrella of transparency, that parents will have access at any point, any time to the report card and uh, whatever the determination is of the, the language, the bottom line is the student's work is there. They can see the work, they can see how it was graded, and the learner can see how it was graded. So where moms and dads and loved ones uh, depended upon conferences or they depend upon a folder coming home once in a while, now the student's work is there readily available at any point, any time. So hopefully we're doing a better job with transparency so you as parents can determine, and ideally the child too, 
how they're progressing. Mr. Peckman, this is the first time um, in the K-6 level that we've had very consistent language on a, um, a report card, because lots of times they go K-3, then they move 4-6 and be completely different. So for the first time, our K-6 team really feels like we're giving the parents an idea of exactly where they're at, and it's the same common language, K-6. to So that's been our focus. And I guess that's my concern. If we have to teach parents a language to understand grades, then isn't the grading system a little too d cumbersome? I mean, if you have math and you have an 89%, I know what that means. But I don't know what all the other standards necessarily mean, and I've been doing this for over a decade. Question. Um, and I see here in winter 2019, January, okay, identified need to investigate alternate reading assessment at the K through 6 level. So what was that driven by, and what are the alternate reading assessments? Are we, we getting rid of some that the state mandates or things that we do and we're doing something different? No, we're looking at what are some other options besides the DRA. So when we look at um, our Common Core assessments, we're looking at does that match up with what we're assessing with the DRA. And so some of that conversation out of our reading committee and out of CI committee has been, is there a possibility to look at some other possible assessments? So that's very much haven't started that yet, but that's one of our next steps. So is the, is the DRA used by most around the county every, I mean, are they used for everybody? So that is there, there are something some other else that we, we're looking at that we think is yeah. maybe something more desirable that? There are some other districts that use um, the DRA. We just feel like when we look at the standards um, from the Common Core, we just don't feel like it parallels and it gives us as much information um, as we need. And so at this point, we're just beginning stages of looking at what are some other options. Um, the K-6 principals had conversations. Um, our reading specialists were just beginning the stages to say what are the other options out there and obviously looking at what are other districts using as well as, you know, where are other districts that are using customized learning, like what are the other assessments that we can look at. And so do we do K through six now with the DRA? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're still grouping the same yes. group of kids. Okay, yeah. all right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Next would be Dr. Zarnecki for technology. And you guys probably thought you'd get rid of me here. I'm back here. So <laughs> I'm really here to give Ryan emotional support this evening. So, uh, but uh, I'm proud to uh, head the MCL Technology Committee, uh, proud of the work that the teachers, faculty, staff have <clears throat> done at, at the committee meetings. Uh, first of all, uh, several goals here. First one is to continue implementation of Skyward Schoology as the mastery recording and reporting. Elementary and secondary continue to re refine our use of Schoology's gradebook to ensure consistency and transparency K through 12. Teachers continue their, their work tagging assessments with the corresponding standards it covers, which will ultimately give educators, parents, and learners the ability to see the standards that they have mastered, which standards a learner is competent or proficient, and which standards a learner is still developing his or her understanding. Another goal of ours is to revise and communicate the 10-year uh, device refresh plan. Learners are doing well with their current devices. We continue to work with Mr. Billa to review, analyze, take feedback to determine when's the best time to move forward um, with a recommendation for a refresh. Uh, another goal of ours is to provide professional development on SAMR model, which is a model to increase the level of meaningful use of technology in the classroom. Um, this will ultimately improve engagement and learning. SAMR stands for substitution, augmentation, modification, redefinition. All levels have or will continue to provide professional development this year. While there's ongoing training for our teachers and support staff during the school day and through department meetings, we do offer specific secondary training in November at the in November in-service, and the elementary will be giving a technology-specific training in April. Uh, technology incorporation was also discussed at the District Professional Education Committee and it was determined that workshops will occur during the summer to assist those who would like additional training. We met recently with Paul Tackett, Apple representative, who shared some free resources that the Apple uh, company provides to our educators. Lastly, um, one of the goals originally was to uh, continue with the Watson pilot as um, the board understands, um, um, 
we are officially departing from Office Max and IBM and the Watson and Light, uh, but it was a good um, lesson on how to fail forward as it allowed us to focus our energies and do some of the similar work that was occurring with Watson with our Schoology platform. So that being said, uh, if anyone has questions, that's my report. Thank you, Dr. Zanecki. And finally, in closing, Dr. Harper, structures. So our first goal with the Structures Committee talks about learning options. And by that, we have been discussing available learning options at each grade level and talking about um, providing equity with learning options across the district and also learner fit with regard to learning options. So at this point in time, we are working on um, some uh, brochures, pamphlets, videos that would um, allow families and learners to help them, or that would allow them to better understand the variety of learning options that our district has and how they know um, if a specific learning option, for example, we have self-paced courses, we have online courses, how does a child know that this is a good fit for me or um, what would make this appealing to me to want to try something new? Uh, so working together, um, across the district K to 12 to come up with um, some materials that can be readily available uh, for all families and for all learners. And then our second goal has to do with the school start time. Sure. Let me just uh, speak on that behalf as I've joined the committee to uh, sort of uh, provide some additional assistance. The goal for um, the reversal of the start of the school day is to research and develop a proposal. And so we have begun uh, obviously the research phase and I think it's pretty clear out there that they talk about adolescents needing more sleep. Um, so we don't believe that that is um, you know, a much, of, much of a lift there. What we have done over the last couple of months is taken a look at schedules, the research with other school districts, what they've done, what they've seen from it. We've also taken a look at all the questions that come up, whether it's co-curricular, transportation, working closely with Mr. Billet. Um, so we are on target at some point in the next couple of months to come back um, with somewhat of the beginning of a conversation to, to move forward uh, as the comprehensive plan talks about it over the next couple of years. And so we continue to make headway, look at schedules, um, discuss, uh, visit, talk with other folks who have done uh, the reverse, and then uh, sort of stage the, the mm -hmm. conversations that we will have here at the board with our community um, as we go forward. So that concludes our comments mm -hmm. uh, from the five committees, and uh, we would remind community members, board members, uh, so forth, so on. If you'd like to join any of the committees, just email me, call me, and uh, we'll make sure that uh, we send an invitation. You could be part of the decision-making process, and uh, I think you'll find the collaborative spirit alive and well, all focused on what Mr. Miller started at the very beginning, making sure our learners get everything they deserve in the Central York School District. So that concludes our comments. The, uh, Mr. Blankenstein. Yeah, I'm on the Structures Committee with Dr. Harper and Dr. Snell. I would like to assure the public that, that we are going through a comprehensive study. There is school districts in New York County that have changed the time, Southwestern being one, and I've had some time to speak with some of the administrators and teachers and faculty and parents, and they seem to have had a lot of success with their program there. So that's something that we are continually doing. We're not just going ahead and making a decision. We are looking at other uh, districts who have made that decision has been looked at pretty good. The data has proven to be pretty successful. Thank you. Uh, sure, Mr. Peckman. Is the goal to flip start times with the uh, primary buildings? Um, the goal is to conduct the research, have the conversation, and, and come back to the board for uh, a recommendation um, with a recommendation uh, that we, we can, uh, I think, collaboratively develop and see where the district would like to go. So, so it is an investigation and to present, I think in year two, our findings um, and have that conversation with the board and the community. I, the only issue I don't know if we've considered is whether or not the uh, elementary school kids get home without their brothers or sisters being home if they start yeah. high school later. Sure. In, in every meeting we've had elementary teachers, secondary teachers, all folks talk about the, the pros and cons with a flip 
we talked about a delay. What if you just pushed back? So we've taken a look, and, and that is that we've had that conversation. So, With the information that was presented tonight, I know a number of us are on <coughs> various committees, but if you have any questions as you're reviewing any of that or anything comes to mind, please get back to Dr. Snell or Mr. Grove, and they'll provide further information. Committees will continue to meet and provide updates throughout the uh, ongoing months. The next item is a opportunity to bring back some additional uh, s services from the LIU. I'll ask Dr. Lee to come forward. Um, if you will recall, but I'll remind you, from 2007-8 school year forward, we have uh, brought back uh, IU services, IU classrooms at a clip. And what I'd like to do is suggest that we do it one more time with our emotional support classrooms. Um, we have information regarding a historical approach to uh, our savings by bringing back classrooms. Um, and I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Lease with uh, Mr. Kessler supporting as well. Ma'am. Good evening. I'd like to share with you, first of all, um, I know you have this in front of you, but if we look at a historical view from special education, I can go back, we can go back as early as 2009-10, which was nearly 10 years ago. We had all our special education supports and services with the exception of learning support, which is your least restrictive um, or um, learning disabilities, the easier one that you typically find in public school settings. So back in 2009-10, we started looking at savings and bringing back classrooms. So what I shared with you is at that point, we had about 150 ADMs, which is that average daily membership. So that's not equivalent to 150 students, it is actually more than that, but if a learner spends 75% uh, of their day in a special education classroom, then that accounts for 0.75 ADM. So it's not quite 150 students, so it was actually more than that, to a, at a cost of $3 million ten, about 10 years ago for all the supports that we received from the IU. Over the past couple years, we have taken back 15 special education classrooms from autism support to life skills support to intensive learning support, <coughs> our speech language clinicians. We've took five of them back and we have three school psychologists. So what I would like to share with you this evening is a little bit what we still have left, but I'd like to talk to you about that large chunk, the last big chunk that we could take back from the intermediate unit. So we are proposing uh, taking back the emotional support program. That is our, our request and our recommendation to you at this point in time. Um, by, by being able to do this, we would take back, um, we could save approximately at the very bottom there, $502,000. The idea right now, the IU, if we were to take back the public, so just like here at Central, we house three different, four different, excuse me, classrooms for emotional support, one at Hayshire, one at North Hills, one at the middle, and one at the high school. In those classes, the majority of those learners are our learners, however, it's an IU run classroom, so we send our kids outside of the district. We'd be able to save about $1 million um, bringing just the public back. But by doing the proposal we're gonna to talk to you about, we have the opportunity to take back center-based emotional and therapeutic support, as well as some of our River Rock learners. So in a nutshell, there would be no more emotional support services provided through the IU. The next section right above where Mr. Kessler has the only thing that would leave with us, the services still at the IU or that would still require that support, we, the multiple disabilities, significant cognitive, dual diagnosed learners, lower incidence disabilities, the numbers and the incidence of that is not great enough for us to have a whole class of that by ourselves. So at this point, we still rely on the intermediate unit for the MDS class, multiple disability supports classroom, dual diagnoses, kiddos who have um, life skills and some emotional significant behavior um, issues. And you can see at present right now the learners and what that cost is on the right hand side. We'd also still be looking at them to provide the occupational therapy and physical therapy and speech services for learners who are at the center. They do not allow us to bring our own therapist in because that's an IU setting. They provide their own therapist. So that's about 83,000 you can see up there. We would also have to continue to pay for the music, phys ed, and any art services that they offer, again, at the learning center. But the significant amount of our learners would still be anybody who's still at the learning center. And again, that's that lower incidence population. So it comes out to be about 15 learners at present. 
We also um, still require the support of the IU for the deaf, hard of hearing, and the blind, visually impaired. There are no agencies, organizations. We continue to look outside to see if there are other um, supports that we could contract for at this time. There are not. Um, so again, we'd have the deaf and hearing impaired. Right now we use some consultation and blind visually impaired. So in a nutshell, looking at all that, that's what we have at the IU. We would have remaining at the IU. Um, we are requesting and recommending that we bring back the emotional support program. And when I say program, I mean those that are in the learning center to the public, both therapeutic and emotional support. Real quickly, emotional support services, as I, I kind of shared on there, the difference between what we're currently doing in our classrooms and the emotional support. Emotional support is the significant social emotion. We talk about the whole child. You've heard us talk about T.W. Panessa. You heard us talk um, about the whole social emotional realm. The emotional support classes, how that is different. These are kids who have significant social emotional needs that impact their education um, and often come with significant behavior. So that is a lot in a real quick short time overview. You also had some other resources with you. I'd be happy to questions, thoughts. Just want to, did, are you gonna reiterate <laughs> Laurel Light? Yeah, <coughs> so our recommendation then uh, moving forward, we would like to propose contracting instead of with the IU, contracting with Laurel <coughs> Life. Um, Laurel Life and the, the one pager you got in a, in a nutshell, they have done this in 18 schools throughout the state. They are looking at adding another 17, 18 next year. They provide the services including, um, like TW Panessa provides for us, they have a certified, um, every classroom has four staff in it. We would not have to staff, so there's a significant savings not having to pay piecers. Um, there is a significant um, sigh of relief to possibly not have to provide that staff ourselves. You've seen a struggle to get assistance and teachers. Um, each classroom is staffed with a, a certified teacher. They have a um, certified school psychologist. They have a certified social worker. And then there's a fourth person who is um, what they call a transition person. And that's for when learners go out into the regular classroom. It's an assistant, like a paraprofessional that will go along, but that is a, at, minimum a bachelor certified where our assistants at this point only have to have a two-year equivalent. So the staffing that they provide is wonderful. They also have that whole therapeutic component of which we are now relying and we would continue to rely on TW Panessa for our um, regular population. This in these classes they have that significant need, that therapeutic need and the Laurel Life program will be able to provide that. So um, they actually give us a lot more for um, what we need than the IU is not providing that therapeutic component for us right now with um, an, the additional social worker <coughs> and the school psych in the classroom. Finally, there was a document, Mr. Kessel, will you just review <coughs> the um, financial Certainly. implications? So we had, we had attached and uh, the one pager that was attached was a simple annual just year to year what the budget savings was, whether we either added additional services or when we brought back uh, programs that Dr. Lees talked about, um, what the savings were in that individual year. So again, up through 2018-19, you can see we've had higher savings individually versus we've added some positions and we've grown as we added a supervisor and some other positions. Now, um, just recently I did, and we can share this and send this out, um, almost to the concept of, okay, that was just an annual number. Um, we ran cumulative, so I used what the IU budget, so even if we look at the 2012-13 year when we brought back the majority of our autistic classes, that was the first big chunk, $190,000 savings in our budget that year. So I took that, if it had stayed at the IU, what would the cost have been, 13, 14, 14, 15, all the way up through present, and ran this out for all of these programs, either the savings or the additional cost, had we not brought anything back and left everything at the IU based on their budgets every single year all the way down through, the cumulative cost is $4.3 million. It's $4,382,000 and change that if in our current $90 million budget, we would have a $94 million budget had we not brought anything back um, over the year. So, we extrapolated that out based on IU costs from 13, 14 through present um, just as a big picture versus it's nice to see, okay, individually you saved money, 
um, cumulative, we can show savings of actual dollars year over year. So we would continue to uh, have that trend. Again, 1920, looking at emotional support um, that Dr. Elise mentioned, we could have between four and 500,000. And we've hit the numbers um, every year, so I feel comfortable, confident that 502,000 could save for our 1920 budget. Questions on the proposal? Mr. Wagner. A couple questions, and I guess, if I understand this correctly, what we're doing, at least in York County, is more typical what other school districts are doing. We're not out there doing this by ourselves and taking classrooms back. Um, we're really, I think, saying that we're bringing back these classrooms, but we're really just going to contract with someone differently to do that, I think. And it'll be, I, if I understand this correctly, we'll have a more formal contract for these services, which we really haven't had in the past. Sure. Correct. And so Eastern York did this seven years ago. They took back their emotional support program and contracted with Laurel Life. There's a few things that that does for us. One, it eliminates the transfer of entity. Um, so we do not have to take, at this point, um, every other classroom that we have taken back from the IU, um, the regs state that we must offer a position to any IU teacher because we're taking their job from them. So if you are in our district and you're in the current four classrooms that have um, teachers from the IU, we would have to offer them positions. Many of them veteran teachers who are at the, who are higher up. Um, so we no longer, we would not have to do that transfer of entity, which is a, a big piece. The other thing through, while yes, there, and there is a more formal contract, there's also some additional supports through the therapeutic, but there's also, um, we sit with them, we do the staffing, like we do it together. So similar to how we contract for our instructional assistance right now, we sit, we interview together, we have final say. So whereas Laurel Life is paying them and they're, you know, they have to agree to, we both have to agree to that position. So it's more our program, I think, than it is right now through the intermediate unit. Um, in the, f we think, five classrooms, how many students do we think in total will be involved in? So we currently have 59 learners that we would be taking back. That includes our center-based and our public, both therapeutic and emotional support classrooms, but it also allows us to take back some learners from River Rock um, who are out, who are placed outside the district. So those 59 learners, the state regs say that we may not have more than 15 learners in a classroom at one time, like full time. So we have to open five because of the numbers and the ages that they are. Um, we currently house four classrooms, one at each level through the IU, but our learners are. As we mature this out and as when other districts may have not have done this, will we be able to contract this portion out to other districts for space? Absolutely. We're kind of making our own mm -hmm. fair share classroom type situation. Yep. What we would like to do, and we continue to meet uh, regionally with the other directors um, in the county. Uh, we get together, we're actually getting together here on Thursday to talk about how can we help each other out. We currently have four learners from other <coughs> districts that come into our autism support, life skills. Um, we have two or three in autism support and two in life skills right now from other districts that we help each other out. Our only request was that next year when we take it back the first year, I didn't want to contract because I wanted to make sure I had it right before I offered it to, to neighbors, but absolutely. Um, and again, just being able to maybe clean up a little bit our program, really tighten up some things and get it straightened out the way we want it. And the last is more of a comment than a question, or Eric. I mean, as I represent Central, Central and Eastern on the IU board, um, what we're doing and other districts are doing does have a real impact on their budget and some of the things that they're doing. Our actual Schedule A costs for the York Learning Center probably will increase a little bit as they have to co collapse some administrative costs with less classrooms. There's a lot of changes going on out there. What they do will probably look a whole lot different in a couple of years as we do these things and other districts too as those changes occur. Thank you. Other questions about the proposal? Okay, so we're looking at five classrooms? Yes. So like this list where it says current locations, it'll then mm -hmm. read Central York School District, five classrooms K through 12. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they won't move from the buildings they're in or they? So what we would do right now, we currently have no learners in the K to three level right now in an IU placement. We do, looking ahead to next year, the third graders will move to fourth grade. 
So we would be looking at a North Hills and a Sinking Springs. So hence our learners will be able to go to their home, their neighborhood, neighborhood school, one at the middle school, and then we would need two at the high school just based on the number of learners that we have at, and how they would um, split up. So our thought process was as we move forward with this, we may shift one of those secondary classrooms to the K3 or figure out how that looks. Also looking at how this floats in with Panther Pathways because we have that great support. Again, as we continue to talk about a continuum of services, we have some great resources now to, to share with that K3. But yeah, so we're looking at Sinking Springs, North Hills, Middle, and then two at the high. And how many children are there at River Rock? Are we, are we comfortable um, with um, Laurel, Laurel Life that they'll be able to provide the services that these children without a distraction. I don't exactly right. know why someone goes to River Rock, but it usually doesn't mean so they're playing. Absolutely. Well. There's a couple different reasons why learners are at River Rock. River Rock, um, there's, there's two components. There's a private academic licensed program, which um, is for special education learners with IEPs who have significant behaviors. Um, so we do have learners there with some behaviors. Basically, it's a center-based um, emotional support classroom. And we have some learners there because the IU doesn't have room in a classroom. So we've had to go there. So those are the learners I would suggest taking back. Um, and it would be on an individual basis. There are still some learners when we figured this in that I'm, we wouldn't take them all back that first year because I would want to see, you know, it would be an individual basis. But there are some learners who are ready to come back to Central York and we don't have the nearest opening in a classroom for a therapeutic emotional support classroom at the elementary level is in Littlestown right now. I will send a child to River Rock rather than ship them to Littlestown. So that's one thing that we're looking at. The other component for River Rock, just to help you, is the AEDY or the Alternative Ed for Disruptive Youth. So those learners would stay there. Um, there those are the kiddos who perhaps an expulsion. We do have two learners right now who are out on expulsion that are at River Rock finishing some programs because they can't be in school, but they have special education needs that can't be met by homeschooling or cyber schooling during their expulsion. So there are some kiddos that are there for AEDY. They would stay. So that's why I said we'd be able to take a portion of our, our River Rock population back. But um, tip, technically, Laurel Life is providing a center-based emotional support program, but they're providing it in our district. So it's no longer having to ship them to a center such as River Rock or the York Learning Center. So they provide that. Um, as we move forward, we could certainly go visit uh, Eastern York. Both Eastern York and West York are doing this. East York has been doing it for seven years. Um, very successful, very proud of it. I've been to their program for the last three years looking at it. West York is finishing off next year. They will fully be K-12. They took it and grew the program. Um, so we could certainly go visit if you would like to look at it at any time as well. And just one last question. Yeah. So I'm thinking to myself, well, that this all seems so good to be true. Um, so we're getting people that have more educational background who are better prepared to, to engage with our students, and it's costing us less. Is it just because of – because the LIU, we don't pay – we don't pay them benefits and all that, do we? Well, yeah. Actually, like how? Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah, we do. Yeah. It's just their fees are so <laughs> astronomical. What's in the, co what's in the cost? We pay cost. So I mean, I'm happy for. Yeah. Right. We're it's able to do it and save money. Right. Yeah. So you can do it. Other questions? Thank you very much. We'll bring this no, up. There's no real actual. Oh, there's no. Yeah, no real actual. Uh, of any action yeah. it'll be part of the budget process and <laughs> thank you Dr. Lewis. next item is the uh, transportation contract um, I will turn it over to uh, mr. <coughs> billet um, and mr. Kessler who have both worked on this and are here to present uh, the findings of the uh, request for proposals for transportation service to the district gentlemen thank you um, just quickly you do have the uh, contract posted uh, in board docs for your review. Um, from a historical perspective, we've been with Durham since 2009. Uh, we did sign an extension in 2013 that runs through the end of this school year, 2019. Uh, in terms of the request for proposal process, we did post our RFP in November and um, initially received six vendors that were interested uh, unofficially. Um, they had until uh, December to submit official proposals, at which time we received four uh, official proposals uh, from, from uh, vendors. Uh, 
Uh, Brent and I spent um, the, the balance of December and January reviewing in detail those contracts um, or, or the, the proposals, I should say, that were presented. Um, there were lots of questions that were asked, um, responded to, and uh, we reached out to some of the vendors as well for clarifications based on their proposal. So why would we recommend uh, Reliance to you, and uh, why do we have that contract posted? Well, number one, Reliance um, checked off all the boxes with a very detailed, comprehensive, and transparent uh, proposal. Uh, their pricing was market competitive uh, in terms of the pricing that we received from not only the four vendors, but as well mm -hmm. as conversation with Dallastown, uh, York Suburban, and West York in terms of what they're currently paying. Um, so mm -hmm. it was very competitive. Uh, it is a local owner. Uh, who has multiple local terminals, and that is terribly important um, as Durham lost some market share here in the area. It was increasingly um, challenging for us um, when we were short drivers um, to pull from other local sources, which we were able to for the last several years um, when Dur Durham had that uh, local market share. So um, that was that, that is going to be, in our opinion, a, a, huge, um, a huge advantage for us. Um, in addition, um, the owner of Reliance also owns our terminal currently. Um, he's leasing that out to Durham, um, so that, that's a plus. Um, as well as the management structure um, and support and training, not only for drivers but for the Reliance uh, leadership team, it was impressive in the proposal and in conversation. Um, and, and we also believe the customer service um, will be outstanding with Reliance, um, including but not limited to route support as well as a call center. Um, that is hosted locally at the uh, at the terminal. Some additional considerations that Mr. Kessler and I reviewed, 90% of the fleet uh, with Reliance will be brand new vehicles. That's important because the age of fleet um, with brand new vehicles will increase our subsidy um, in the neighborhood of $40,000 is what we project uh, in addition to what we're currently generating uh, in subsidy from the state. Um, Mr. Pauly is, is um, going to upgrade significantly the fuel pumps and fueling stations on site as well as modifications uh, to the terminal, which I think will be uh, very pleasing to, to our drivers. Um, they have a strong history of, of safe operation, which is, is number one priority, hands down. Um, and there will be a lot of new safety features on, on the new vehicles that we will um, receive as part of this contract. Uh, including some cameras on vans, which we currently do not have. So uh, that was included in the proposal. And then finally, um, I believe they have a very strong driver retention plan, um, as well as um, salaries and incentives um, that, that um, our hope and our belief is that that will uh, retain some of the wonderful drivers that we do currently have on staff. Um, so all of that said, it, um, Reliance's contract was um, far and above a contract that uh, Mr. Kessler and I felt um, very good about and again was, uh, was very, very competitive and uh, again met the criteria that we were looking for. So that contract is, is, is posted for your review. Um, we would like to take action on that on February 11th so that we can begin um, that process of, of transition to be ready for operation. Um, officially as of July 1 is when that new contract would go into effect that would run through um, 2000, uh, the school year ending 2024. Yes, uh, uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Kessler. Uh, we did have our solicitor review that. Um, so uh, they reviewed the contract, uh, had made a few recommendations that we sent back to Mr. Pauly and uh, his team um, accepted those as well. So the version that you have in front of you has been reviewed by attorneys on both sides. So pending any questions, that's the update I have on our transportation contract. Questions? Mr. Wagner? A number of things. Um, I re tried to go through it today to a certain extent the best I could. Um, one of the things I saw in there that all the vehicles are not immediately coming with the automatic chain drop or whatever that is, mm -hmm. that that's an additional purchase per day type of thing. Is that something we have now? No, we don't have that on all vehicles right now. It's, it's only a few. Yeah, no, it's only a few vehicles that are in some of the um, uh, hillier areas of, <laughs> of the district, and they are the automatic drop chain. So we requested um, the same number of drop uh, chain vehicles um, that we currently have. Um, so that's a question standard. several years ago. I think it was NSBA. I was with the Durham people, and I our representative, I think, and I asked him, what, what do you do for self-monitoring for quality insurance? And his response was, well, I'm not going to tell you exactly what he said to me. Do, is there a piece in here where we're asking Reliance to do some of their own QA just 
however you would do that? Mm -hmm. I mean, what is our expectation of that, of self-monitoring? That is in the contract. It, it is expected that the contractor will have their own quality assurances um, in-house, but that is also um, meeting the expectations that we have as a district as well. And so that's part of what I would do is, is, is work with, with Reliance to ensure that we meet monthly with our bus drivers for, for safety meetings. We would continue to do that um, with Reliance. Um, I, we have also recommended that we bring back a, um, a sort of um, safety task force, if you will, which is, is a representation of drivers um, uh, that meets on a monthly basis as well to share concerns, to share ideas um, related to, to safety on board, discipline, um, make sh ensure that our administrators, our teachers, um, are responding appropriately to things that are happening on the bus. We, um, that, that is a, a requirement. I, you mentioned a little bit of the workforce retention <coughs> and recruitment and retention of bus drivers is never going to be a problem solved, <coughs> whether there are supports in our classrooms, whatever that is. I guess I was pleased to see, because I guess it's an issue now, may have helped last week maybe with some of the issues we concerned that all the terminal and administrative people will have CDLs and I guess that's a problem now it's just fill in type of thing so that's a real positive piece with that as well I was glad to see that um, how many vehicles do we have on the road each day we have 97 runs 97 total times two a lot of those are two runs I guess and two right or is that it's 97 total runs okay so mm -hmm. 50 40 yeah something like that and the one thing that was in there in the price comparison or the listing down, it's in their proposal, but it wasn't in the piece, all the field trips and the athletics and co-curriculars. Is there some way we can get an idea of what that total piece is? Because that's really a moving target, I think. We, we can provide that. We elected not to because it is such a moving target from year to year depending on you know, uh, um, the trips, but there is a trip fee that we would be happy to, to yeah, load and provide to more you. I guess the last thing I asked for Brent, if you could do a side-by-side, -side what our current costs are and what the proposed are, just, and that's something we could look at, not that it makes any difference for me, but I just was interested in that. Right. We, we can, and that and that's what'll be part of the budget. So back in December, we had anticipated, again, as Mr. Billet said, coming up from 2013 rates up to what the market rates are or will be for 2019 20 so we build in an increase in our budget um, this actually as a result of this that total budget of three or four million dollars will come in just under what we budgeted so we will as a cumulative cost come in slightly under what we had anticipated the cost going up to we do it a, a year mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. now and and coming up or whatever it is thank you mm -hmm. other questions Mr. Lewis? I'll just ask, I guess, an ugly question, but based on what we heard happen in West York, do you have concerns about monitoring the conduct on buses? Uh, I don't. Um, it, is it a concern? It's always a concern. It's part of the safety um, responsibility that we have to keep all learners safe. Um, the, the, the job that our bus drivers have, and I don't care whether it's driving for Durham, Reliance, STA, it doesn't matter who it is. Um, it is one of the most challenging jobs in all of public education. The responsibility is huge. And so um, I have um, the, the strongest confidence that the procedures and policies that we have in place that we have worked on since 2009 with Durham will continue with Reliance. Um, and again, that's, that's part of, of, of our responsibility as leadership within the district to ensure that things are in place to prevent those kind of things from happening, that there is um, training provided to the drivers while they're on the road, how do they handle certain situations. I already alluded to those safety meetings, um, those safety task force uh, conversations, um, but making sure that our administrators are responsive as well and, uh, and that we're communicating with families. So um, I'm confident that, that um, through those, those preventative measures that we will continue um, regardless of, of what vendor um, is serving us to uh, to provide that safe uh, ride to and from school. Mrs. Uh, Johnson. So currently, we don't have cameras on our buses. Well, no, we do. We have cameras on our buses. We do not currently have, have cameras no on on vans. So we're just saying these guys, in addition to what we currently Correct. have, and then also, Mr. Kessler, you were saying that basically for the budget, we're going to come in a little uh, under. But then going back to Mike's question about the extracurricular. 
are we com are you comparing apples to apples that the basic <coughs> runs are going to be less Correct. and whatever yes. that right. other cost is we still haven't really right. pinpointed that because it's going to be but we have an apples we, to apples <coughs> number we do we have an apples to apples number that we can provide we, you know again it, it just changes from year to year there's also some of our trips some of our field trips um, are are covered under some building budgets where that doesn't actually come out of the transportation bottom line and so some of those things are also funded by PTOs um, the athletic trips are actually um, paid out of Mr. Trimmer's budget for athletics so um, we just elected not to show you those numbers we certainly can and we will and we do have apples apples to apples comparison yep Mr. Blankenstein yeah I'm just concerned of what happened last week you give are you giving me the impression or giving us the impression that that would not happen with Reliance they had a problem with drivers not showing up um, and that's one of the reasons we had the snow day. Is this something that would Reliance would would be able to handle that the, Durham couldn't? Um, the expectation with any vendor is that we have a continuity of service, regardless of, of the decision that, dis that the district makes. Can I sit here and tell you that it will never happen with Reliance? I don't think that I can. What I will tell you is that with the advantage of having a terminal and serving Dallastown, serving York Suburban, serving West York, <laughs> A similar situation that happened on Thursday has happened several times and did happen over the last um, three and a half years that I've been in this position. What we were able to do, though, is much more easily draw extra drivers that were at those terminals for other districts to bring them over to Central to cover routes that, that um, we didn't have covered. So what I'm suggesting is that this um, local relationship um, and, and several districts within um, very close proximity to us will will hopefully prevent that from happening driver shortage uh, of, of bus drivers it's a national problem a significant national problem and um, so I, I think it would be unfair to, to say or inappropriate for me to sit here and promise that that will never happen again um, certainly we hope that it doesn't um, but I think that this puts us in a position where um, we mitigate some of the some of the issues that we had Thursday just to clarify that I mean essentially and I, I don't know if how many people are really aware of this. I mean, we didn't have school Thursday because we didn't have enough drivers to bring the kids to school, right? Correct. Okay. Um, in terms of feature requests, is there any way that we could get any kind of feedback from the buses in kind of a real-time environment to allow parents to know when the buses are maybe running a little ahead, a little slower? I don't know if that capability exists. But I can tell you from, from feedback that I've perceived that some parents are concerned about that, that there's variability. And that's the nature of a bus. You know, a kid's running out to the road and the driver's not going to take off and leave them just because it's time to go. They'll wait for the kid like they should. But, you know, those errors and that time accumulates and then parents have to adjust their schedule and things. Would there be any way that we could eventually work toward having some kind of data like that without compromising security as well? Mm -hmm. Um, we are able to collect that data now um, that, that we can run detailed reports, um, even down to uh, when the, the, the yellow and red lights were activated on the bus, when the doors were opened at what stop and when they were closed. Um, but in terms of parents having access to that, there are some third-party apps and, and some providers that tap into the GPS on the bus that do provide some of those, those pieces. Um, it is very expensive, and um, there are th there, there's a lot of algorithms that are kind of run through those that that they have not historically proven to be entirely accurate so um, that was one of the conversations that we had um, and moving forward um, I'm confident that that between ourselves and 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 reliance and mr. Pauly that we will look for um, that technology in the next several years to I think develop to the point that we may be able to offer that offer that at some point we just don't feel that that it is it is as efficient and effective as what it could be for what we would have to pay for it right now. Thanks, and and maybe a, a way to look at that might even be on a subscription basis. If a parent's that concerned, they could maybe purchase that from the vendor possibly. But right. I just thought it'd be something we could ask about. Thank you. Well, and and, and I'll, I'll just add that I think the 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 most critical piece to that is having really tight um, and consistent run times. Period. Like that that would eliminate completely the need for that if we can be as consistent as we can. Our other challenge in, in the district is that mm -hmm. we have two major um, heavily congested travel corridors that run right through our district. So, 
Uh, it's, <laughs> right, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I, I, if we find a good solution, certainly we'll look at it. I could agree with you. Any other questions, comments? I have one other question, I think, Eric. I think I saw this in the contract. I think as times change, we end up with the final approval of any subcontracting the contract or selling of the contract of some different thing. We have, there's something in the contract that protects us of getting a little more involved maybe we, than we've been in the past, or is that a new, you know, okay. Yeah. I, I, wonder how, I mean, obviously, we don't have the, the budget of Uber, but um, I don't know what they use, but you can always see exactly where they are when they're coming. But rapid transit, don't they, um, they have a service where you can see when the bus will be arriving at your location? Again, could be a million dollars, I don't know. Right now, it's expensive. So, uh, just one final comment to, to <coughs> Mr. Gothi's point about run times. Uh, even though we were down a couple drivers that day, two things to take into account: uh, it was one of the coldest days that we had, and there was a major accident or a major incident on 83 that clogged all the side roads uh, that would have created bus runs being late, uh, as it was, and with no way to really identify or notify, and with you know, children out there for a long period of time that morning. It, it was almost a blessing in disguise that we didn't get bus drivers to be able to do those runs simply because of the accident that occurred or whatever it was that just completely gridlocked everything around 30 and the surrounding roads. So we'll have this on for next week. Next item are the uh, Lincoln Benefit Trust rates. Uh, Mr. Kessler? Certainly. So uh, we posted for you what the recommendation will be for 2019-20 um, budget year, fiscal year. Uh, there's no change from what now was implemented effective on 1-1-2019. So when we started the 18-19 year, uh, the rates were higher, and based on negotiations and the new plans, uh, the rates were reduced for January 1, and that's what's been implemented, and we're seeing some savings already. Um, and so this would be a reduction from our current technical 1819 rates. Um, and we've shared some of those numbers in our preliminary budget. And so this will again uh, fine tune our budget when we come back in the spring. Um, so it'll be no technical increase from this January 1. The rates will remain what they've been reduced to. Um, so we'll be happy to take any questions that you would need. Mr. Wagner? What I was going to ask you if we could do a side by side, but if we go back to. We, the rates we would have approved last year this Correct. time. They're we higher with the than single and the spouse and all those things. Are, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Correct. Anything else? The trust uh, approved all the rates on Thursday night at the Thursday night meeting, and we'll have this on for approval next week. Next item uh, is a uh, follow up to the aquatics fees. I will ask. Uh, Ms. Romick to come forward and as well Ms. Lane. Um, we said we would follow up with uh, a, a look at uh, the rates that we charge for our aquatics program. Um, so I'll turn it over to Ms. Romig uh, for a walkthrough of the attachment that you see on the screen. Yes, good evening. Um, our, just for historical purposes and context, the natatorium actually opened a decade ago, which seems hard to believe now, but it's been a decade. And at that time, we had a pool committee that formed that included board members, community members, parents and guardians and staff to look at how we could launch a community aquatics program that would cover the costs of operating the program, but would be mindful of the fact that our taxpayers were contributing to the operation of the pool already. So how could we structure the fees in a way that it would be a benefit and a resource to community members of all ages from the youngest um, swimmers starting out to senior citizens uh, where that might be their only time that they are in our building and using that facility. Um, we also knew that non-residents would want to use the pool and we looked at fee structures that would um, benefit our residents but also not be astronomical for our non-residents. And then I guess about five years ago we looked at those fees again. Um, and did sort of a countywide assessment of where we fell in terms of similar offerings um, through similar facilities from a resident and non-resident perspective. So for the purposes of tonight, Kat has put together another similar perspective that will um, she'll walk you through and will give you sort of a high level overview of where we are currently within um, comparison to other countywide structures like ours. 
Good evening. Um, yes, as Miss, as Julie said, um, we are comparatively one of the lowest cost uh, programs available to our residents and non-residents. Um, about the lowest is Red Lion there with $12 for preschool lessons and $32. Um, and most of these programs are running very similar. They're running a Red Cross program, <coughs> are the ones that I chose to include. Uh, most, of the, Several of these programs run a two-week uh, schedule, so they're, they have the kids for eight lessons over two weeks. Um, we have experimented with doing some shorter term lessons just to kind of benefit the parents and our swim lesson participants as well as um, trying to fit it into our busy, busy schedule. Um, below on this sheet, you'll see the cost for swim lessons for um, some of the membership programs in the area. Uh, Comparatively, we are much lower. Um, six, uh, the rough cost is about $60 for preschool swim lessons and levels one to six. Um, so preschool is typically defined as ages six and under. Levels one to six are um, elementary typically, but they can go all the way up to adults. So if you look at that first sheet, that was really what we wanted to share with you this evening, just to sort of start the conversation as you prepare for the April budget meetings and workshops, and we're looking at approval of some sort of a fee schedule for next year to give you an overview of just kind of where we fall, um, and then going forward, if there would be a desire to have additional research um, into other aspects of the natatorium, um, including usage, um, other potential costs and expenses that might impact the overall operation of the natatorium, um, in addition to looking at possible adjustments to these fees to bring them up a little more um, to the mid-level mid or a higher range, if that was the desire of the board. We thought we would share this with you tonight to just give you that information so we could um, start discussing it going forward. Uh, I Thank you for the information, for the uh, work you did to, ch to check into all these programs. What I'd like to suggest to the board is that um, we actually name an ad hoc subcommittee to work with the aquatics group um, administration between now and April, May time frame when we would have to approve uh, actually all our fees uh, and come back to the board with recommendations uh, of where these uh, or where this fee structure should probably wind up being adjusted to. Um, you know, it would be much easier to have that discussion in a smaller group and come back with a recommendation. I don't want to put it just on the administration to say, well, here's what we're recommending the fees to be without some board input early on, and I think a small subcommittee could probably more effectively do that and come back to the whole group with a recommendation. Um, unless there's some objections to that, um, I would be looking for and probably naming a couple people to, to serve on that, that subcommittee. What's anybody's thoughts on that idea? Mrs. Johnson? I'd be happy to mm -hmm. assist. Um, and I would like to say that um, when I was looking at this the other day, um, the, the comparative cost um, chart obviously speaks volumes. Um, mm -hmm. And that was a very good assessment because I was reading across and I'm going eight hours and, you know, eight classes and four classes and then I found that wonderful little cheat sheet on the end there. So um, that really does um, give us a good sense of where we are. And I know that we're very concerned. I'm not looking to race people out, it, out of the pool. Um, but at the same time, uh, when we talk about our schedules and our um, being so tight and not being able to provide lessons, I mean, maybe some of that additional cost not only uh, maybe helps with the natatorium expenses, um, but that also could help um, help us to provide additional swim instructors that would um, be able to service our community members in particular. That's my biggest concern is our community members um, and uh, by offering more classes. Um, I, know that, I know the schedule in that pool is tight, but again, um, having a little bit more revenue to provide those services might be a, a, you know, 
make it a twofold exercise that I would love to participate in. Well, you're the first one. Yeah. Certainly. Sure. I have a Mr. 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 Peckman. Will the uh, committee be looking at all fees or just aquatic fees? <laughs> well, this this particular committee uh, in for this item would be just looking at aquatic fees. Okay. I want to keep it a little bit more narrow as far as that's concerned because unless I'm mistaken, I think the, <coughs> the aquatics fees have gotten way out of balance with the surrounding competitiveness, whereas I think the other fees have been reviewed a number of occasions more frequently than the aquatics fees to keep us in a ballpark range where we're in a much more competitive situation with surrounding facilities that have auditoriums or gymnasiums or things like that. I think we've sort of fallen behind on the aquatics piece. Mrs. Gemma. So is it safe to assume that the classes that we do offer are full yes. and with okay. waiting lists? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I would say that they're out of balance and I would like to be on the committee as well. It's two. I'll look for an, another person or two. Um, if you want to volunteer, let me know. If not, I'll make a phone call or two. So I won't put you on the spot now, but we'll get back to you. And that's the way we'll, we'll proceed forward with this. And thank you very much, Kate. Yeah. Thank you. Next item is the York Adams Academy 2019-20 budget. Mr. Kessler. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So uh, last week at the electronic York Adams Academy meeting, because the regular board meeting of York Adams Academy was um, canceled because of snow on Tuesday, um, they took action on the budget. Uh, so all board members had, and we've been presenting the budget at the York Adams Academy in November, again December, um, and then we did another presentation in January. Uh, and so it's had uh, its iterations and its process that it's gone through. Uh, as noted, there's no tuition increase planned for next year. Uh, our seats are included in what was our preliminary and current budget. Um, uh, the York Adams Academy Board voted to approve the budget uh, at their level, which sends it out to all the member districts. And so now in February, uh, member school districts will act on it, similar to the uh, tech school process. Um, and then upon approval, it will be uh, implemented. So uh, we'll gladly take any questions. It's the same as this current year. We're purchasing 17 seats. We currently, as of April, or April, um, February 1st have 16 of our 17 seats are filled. Um, we've averaged between 14 uh, to 15 seats a year, so uh, our needs are being met and our seats are being utilized. Um, no increase proposed. So again, uh, Director Wolfgang and uh, um, Director Gemma have been participating and you know updating you throughout the year, but we'll gladly take any questions. Questions regarding the YAA budget? Mr. Wagner? I thought a question I had was I didn't think we were more towards our 12 seat, most of the reports I've heard, rather than staying up at the upper level of the number of the 17 over the months. And not saying that I don't think those five extra seats aren't important. Um, I think this is a very <coughs> cost effective budget, what they do down there. But I think that's something we can look at over time. Are we really, because I, I don't, the reports I remember hearing were not always utilizing those extra seats all the time. Correct. I think we've at, we've been above 12 this year for okay. the year, which is the first time. In yeah. the past, we were at 8, 10, 11, and Dr. Sound. Last Sandine, year, when you asked year, the very same question, correct. we were a little lower than we seem yeah. to be now. This year, I think we've been above 12. Absolutely. And again, as of this past Friday, we had 16 enrolled. We've had some graduate already. So this year's been much better. It's the highest utilization yeah. it's been that I can remember in a while. What if we needed more than 17? You can contract... Uh, to purchase, purchase more seats mm -hmm. with, the, with the with uh, the program. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Eastern did that for a couple of years. They were in the, the group that dropped out. They contracted to get seats when they needed them. They're back in now because they've seen their need uh, increase to the point where they have. Uh, and I'm guessing the ad hoc ones are probably more expensive than <laughs> the contracted ones. Mm. No, not because not we're a member at 12 and above. I think right. we so we get the per tuition rate that. and it's prorated either first semester, second semester. So it would be the mm -hmm. same cost. So we have some flexibility. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily a hard cap. Okay. No, that's right. 
Any other questions on the YA budget? That'll be on for next week. Next item are the dual enrollment agreements. Just a quick one, an annual approval. We've talked about, I think you approved the committees several months ago. They have uh, brought forward the agreements. Be happy to answer any questions, but it is an annual approval. Okay. Uh, tentative adoptions of policies, first reading. I'd ask Ms. Billman if she wouldn't mind coming forward and just giving us a brief overview. So there are four policies um, here that um, just came right from our most recent meeting in the policy committee. The two of them, the first two, policy 103 and 104, dealing with non-discrimination in the classroom and also in employment and contract practices, um, are just um, inserting some language with gender identity so that we are um, following not only our practice in the district but also um, supporting a recent federal court decision out of the Eastern District of Pennsylvania um, identifying the school's legal responsibility to accommodate transgender students under Title IX. So just making one addition there in those two policies. Policy 247 um, makes some updates that are required under Act 80 um, in reference to um, hazing and anti-hazing. And then Policy 249 making an adjustment there. Um, again, linking um, what we already do under Policies 103 and 103.1 um, in conjunction with hazing and anti-hazing as well, because there's a link between the bullying and cyberbullying and the non-discrimination harassment pieces of all of those <coughs> policies. So we're just making some some um, additions there to make that link a little bit cleaner and clearer. Questions or comments? I, I would just say that I guess the uh, 249 though could be possibly up for further review as mm -hmm. the bullying committee and whatnot goes forward. And Correct. And that's what it's would happen. It's just an interim yes. step. Yep, this is just one step. And then um, we meet again the end of March as a policy committee. So it's very possible you may see it again come April <laughs> for another sure. round of changes. Yeah. Mr. I Gossi? just note that, the, I mean, the Boyertown case, uh, I actually read that. Uh, and I mean, we're bound by federal law, uh, regardless of what uh, decisions anybody may want to make. I mean, we have to follow the law. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be uh, sued to kingdom come, lose, and uh, pay lots of money and still have to do the same thing anyway. Yeah. yeah. You're exactly right. Seeing no other questions, we'll have those on for first reading next week. Last item is a final adoption of policies. Second reading, we brought the school wellness before last month. We'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. On school well, I don't, think, I don't think we got any feedback on that one, so it's pretty straightforward. We'll have that on for final adoption next week. <coughs> that ends the discussion items for the night. Uh, gender review, we've covered an awful lot tonight. There'll be a number of things on next week. In addition, the any personnel issues, fundraising, um, facility usage, and the financials. Uh, Barb Johnston, do you have any questions if you're still there? I don't have any questions. I have a comment. Sure, go ahead. Can, um, I just wanted to say I think it's exciting that with the update we got on the comprehensive plan, all the responsibility that we're starting to place on our learners. Um, just the idea that we're getting into mentoring. Um, we're using our learners to help develop the app or the web-based, uh, whatever they decide to do for the personal learning network. I just think it's the right way to go. I mean, we're, what a great way to educate our kids. That's my main comment. Thanks. And at any time that you're on the phone conversation, if you have something to, to pipe up in at that time, please just yell out and we'll recognize you. Um, okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, brings us to citizens' comment, our second opportunity for citizens' comment to address the board. Uh, please just again. Approach the microphone, state your name, uh, and affirm that you are a district resident, and you can let us know what's on your mind. Um, in regards to the non-discrimination policy, is it possible I can get the legal um, description of this Approval of this Act 9 
I would like to read what it says that you're saying it went through the court. Uh, yeah, uh, we could yeah, get, somebody get that to you. Yeah. Sure. Are you saying it was settled? to the United States Supreme Court. And that's where it's headed. Well, So it's not a done deal. But it's it's a binding decision on us until it would be overturned. Well, then I have some questions in regards to this. Um, when does respect versus acceptance become an issue as far as the role of our students? On the form, it says a person who is adversely affected by the offensive conduct may file a report of discrimination on his or her own behalf. I'd like to know what is considered offensive. Um, this policy removes the scientific belief that there are two sexes at birth, male and female. This policy will encourage students to choose a gender of their choice, denying their scientific biological sex. This policy will remove the freedom of conscience and individual religious beliefs. This policy will open sport teams to allow a biological male who identifies as a female the equal right to any extracurricular choice, vice versa. This policy will open restrooms and locker rooms. If security and protection of students is your priority, how will this policy protect students who believe their privacy is being violated and are bullied into acceptance? That is what is going to happen. So what are your detailed regulations when we're talking about locker room, restrooms, and sport teams? And if a student comments that they only believe there are two sexes, is that offensive to somebody? Is that discrimination comment? Uh, where, where, where are we going with this? I, I have a lot of questions and I'm really concerned. Um, I, don't, I don't feel this should be in there. It is not federally or state approved and it, it is headed to the Supreme Court. And I think you're jumping the gun by putting this in the policy now. I think you need to go. Thank you, Shelva. Anyone else right now? Any board member comment? Do we have an option to wait? I mean, I understand. I mean, I can, I, I hear what Shelva's saying, and, and it's, it's, it's a little concerning because there's that other side where you have children who might take offense to some, you know, a, a child that's identifying with another gender, whether it's in a locker room and in sports. I know we talked about it a little bit last week and that they're in, you know, they, they're using um, different bathrooms at times, but. It is, I mean, I know it's where our society is going and I'm not saying that I have an issue with people struggling with their identity or trying to figure out a different identity, but how does it play out for, for all of these things that were, she just brought up? I mean, kids that, what happens to the kids that find it offensive that there's a boy that's a girl that's now on their team? Or, you know, do we, do we have to make the change if it's not, wouldn't it be a good answer to ask our attorney who might be here next week? Sure. We can. I mean, we talk about all, and they're, you know, and these are these are children that are an exception, um, just like any of them with a handicap or pregnancy. They're, they're people that have a special need, and I think there are some people that might find it very difficult to make that mental uh, assessment, whether it's just the way they were raised or their religion or whatever it may be, that we're possibly jumping the gun a little bit. Mr. Gothi. I, I would just suggest, um, I, I think it would be worthwhile to have the decision distributed to uh, board members to take a look at. And I think it would be worthwhile to have some discussion uh, with Mr. King and with the administration as to about how this will practically be implemented. Uh, in Central, uh, I think the Boyertown case, they talk about the facts in it. I, I think it's very illuminating. It's hard to kind of do that in this context without everybody really having an opportunity to have read what was litigated and what was subject to the litigation. And when you read it, <coughs> you start to have a little bit more of an understanding about how not only maybe a transgender student is treated, but also what 
the impacts are in other students uh, that may have concerns about that. And I think that they, the, the court did as best it could to come up with a humane, uh, reasonable way to address as many concerns as it could. Uh, was it perfect? Probably not. We're human beings and we're, we're incapable of that. But I think uh, having a discussion in the absence of that context uh, is, is premature and would likely lead to some confusion. I would tend to agree. Thank you. We'll get that distributed to everybody and we can have that discussion with, with the attorney. Yeah, Mr. Blankenstein. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be great to have discussion of this at the retreat next Saturday? Would that be advisable or not? No, we'll have the discussion here. Okay. We're not going to have an attorney there. So, okay. I have a question. Other board comment. I have a question on a different topic. Sure. Uh, Mr. Grove, where are we on Safe Touch? Do we have a new timeline? Did letters go out? Where are we on that? Uh, we do. We do. And that just came to conclusion today. So um, I don't think I'm jumping the gun because Ms. Page uh, shared, and I'd look at uh, Ms. Romy uh, just to confirm this. But the parents, district letter to parents, we're looking at April 17th. Letter of permission to parents, April 18th. Parent meeting, April 30th, 6.30. So I'll get this to you. We'll get this out. Make sure that you don't have to write it down. But if yeah. you want to, that's fine. But again, April 30th, <laughs> parent meeting, 6.30, 7.30. Uh, Pre-assessment, as we talked about before, that'd be the week of May 6th, Safe Touch program, week of May 13th, post-assessment, January 2020, and then post-assessment, May 2020. So that just came to fruition today. The only reason it's that late is just because the other school districts, the time slot, we've lost our time slot. But that's okay. We still can get it in, and all will move forward. So we'll make sure that we get those dates out to the entire board so you have those. You're welcome. Other board comment? Mr. Peckman. Um, did you, I thought we heard earlier in the year from a parent who said there were some grading changes at the middle school. Is that correct or not? That's correct. And if so, how? what were the changes? Because I'm just looking at the course select or our student handbook for <coughs> this school year, and it says grades are going to be based upon percentages. They are. It was, um, it, it, uh, grades went to percentages, and uh, it was cumulative grading. Okay. So we changed for the better then. For the better? Well, we changed That's from just a straight A to a percentage grade. Uh, yes, sir. So you're right. It used to roll up to a four, three, We're, two, or one, and it's now a percentage. But it's not going to the Schoology-based or Skyward-based standards checklist. Um, I think there. Uh, I, so I think there's a, a merge going on in, across the entire district between a percentage, which equates to mastery, and standards. So is this piece of student work evidence of this standard? And I did. Did I get a 80 percent or higher on it? So there's a, there's a duality going on. Okay. And then one other question. Um, if we were to uh, eliminate half days on August 30th, September 20th, and April 9th, and make them uh, full in service days on October 11th, February 14th, and March 13th, would that wreak havoc with planning and it, in services, that sort of thing? It would, um, it's a contractual issue. I mean, the Act 80 half day is, is a counts as a student day. Um, the contract has the number of full in-service days that you can have. So th that's, that's just it. There's a contractual piece to that. It, it's not as simple as saying you can add for every one of the blue half days, you can add an in-service day um, because you still have to. Th they all count as student days as well. So it pushes um, the number. There's a problem there. I think that would inadvertently increase student days. Oh, half day. Isn't a half day considered a full day? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm con if you could maybe just explain it. Clarify. Thank sure. Yep. <coughs> Other comment? Mr. Wagner. That's really a contractual issue. I mean, that's something we can flush out more in an executive session, sure. I think, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else on the board? Thank you very much. This meeting is adjourned.